Jeremy Lee in the building and every guest that you ever needed. Sports cards after hours keep the hobby heated. Updates, hobby talk like you've never seen it. Sports cards live and nothing could ever beat it. Sports cards is a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Welcome to another episode of Sports Cards Live with your host, Jeremy Lee. All right, welcome everybody to episode number 162 of Sports Cards Live. It is Saturday, November the 26th, 2022, and my name is Jeremy Lee. I would like to thank Steve Johnston of Game Day Sports Cards and Pawn Stars for joining us last week. I would also like to thank the panel who joined us last night. For an episode of Hobby Hangout and discussing all of our expo pickups. What a fun show that was. We had like eight people on the screen. Check that out on the YouTube channel. Tomorrow on Collectible Live, our guest is formal, former Baltimore, Baltimore Orioles and Atlanta Braves employee Danny Black, who is now an industry consultant and a content creator, will be sharing his 30,000 foot view of the hobby. We'll be going live tomorrow at 7 o'clock Eastern. Please join us on this channel or the Collectible app. YouTube channel. Another Hobby Hangout episode will be coming your way next Friday with the Sports Card Investor crew. Jeff Wilson, Doug, and Teapot will all be joining. And next Saturday on Sports Cards Live, Ken Richardson of Pastime Sports Cards will be our guest. I would like to shout out the Center Stage app. Download the app in the App Store for quick comps, whether you are shopping at a card show or pricing your cards out for a card show. The app is continuously improving, so please join me in supporting the great team they have and the innovation that they are undertaking. Also want to shout out Leighton Sheldon and Just Collect. Leighton will be joining us tonight for the Vintage Update segment. And also let everybody know that Whatnot is back as a channel sponsor. We will be streaming live to the Whatnot platform starting very soon, as well as continuing to stream live to all the usual platforms. Check out the Whatnot app for auctions, group breaks, buy it now. It's hosted around the clock by some of the best breakers in the hobby. I'd like to thank all of our loyal list podcast listeners, viewers of the show. If you're not yet subscribed to the channel, please take a moment and do so. And as always on Sports Cards Live, your comments, your questions are in play. Well, let's get to tonight's guest. He started in the hobby in 1988 when his father bought him a pack of Donruss baseball. He worked at a card shop in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. in the late 1990s and slowed down his activity from 2000 to 2010. He dove back into the hobby in 2011 as a dealer and started his YouTube channel in 2020, which is now one of the most important channels in the hobby. His favorite team is the Washington Football Club, and his favorite athlete is Cal Ripken Jr., originally from Maryland, currently hailing all the way from the Netherlands, where it is, I don't know what time right now. Let's bring him out. Chris (laughs) Sewell. Welcome back to Sports Cards Live. How are you doing? What time is it? What's going on? Yeah, I'm, I'm great, man. It's four. Uh, it's four a.m. or four o three, I guess a.m. But uh, yeah, no worries. Got my got my tea, wide awake, ready to go. And they're, yeah, they're not the Washington Football Team anymore. They're they're the uh, Washington Commanders. But although actually, kind of like the Washington Football Team, I think that's a better name anyway. <laughs> I do too. So as I was telling you, I uh, you know you you've been on the show before. It's actually exactly a year ago, minus yeah. a day. It's like the same weekend, just coincidentally, that you're coming back. Yeah. And uh, so I went back to my notes from that show, and I just grabbed the same intro. I thought, you know what? <laughs> It'll be, we'll just use the same one again. Yeah, it still works. I, for, I forgot to update that they're now called the uh, the Commander. So yeah. now we can stick with football team. I, I like that better. I don't. I don't blame you. It's kind of. It, it kind of has that traditional soccer type feel uh, mm-hmm. to it. So you are yeah. you are in the Netherlands, which is where you run your hobby business from where you create all your content for you, for your YouTube channel. Uh, how are things over there? How are things going over there in the Netherlands hobby wise for you right now? Well, hobby, hobby wise is very little. So uh, all, all my, basically all my hobby activity I do in the States when I travel there, but uh, there, there's not much here. Um, there's no like shows or anything. There, there's a show once in a long while. That's very, very small. Uh, and, you know, usually two hours away or something like that. And I'll, I'll go to it, but. Not a lot of activity here. There is a there is a car I, I mentioned you just not too long ago. There was a, there is a card store about an hour away in Germany that I've gone to a few times. It's a pretty impressive card store, and they they have you know a, fa- a fairly good customer base. I mean, every time I go in there, it's it's pretty crowded. So I guess that's a good sign for the hobby expanding into Europe. Well, and when we were tra- chatting about that earlier, and I said to you, "Oh, that must be a uh, Kiki and his brother, who's whose yeah. uh, Instagram handle is." 
art is bullshit. That's his, that's his Instagram you handle. Yeah. <laughs> you have the artist and you have Kiki, who's Kiki's actually a pretty well-known hobbyist. Uh, as far as my perception goes, I met him at a couple of nationals now. And I remember seeing him at the, the bleaker trading uh, trade pre trade night uh, back, back in July of this year. So what uh, w- tell us a little bit about their shop and your experience going in there for the first time. Did they know, did they know who you were seeing as you have a pretty prominent, uh, you know, footprint on YouTube? Uh, no, they, they didn't, they didn't know. So uh, yeah, I, I should just mention to your audience how funny that was. I, I was like, Oh yeah, there's a, the card store, you know, over in Germany and, and Jeremy was like, Oh, you know, the, the brother, the brothers. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Somehow. So, so I guess it is a small world, even across continents, but um, no, I've been in there, I think only twice, maybe three times. The first time I went in, it, they had just opened uh, and they already had, it was already pretty crowded and uh, the, no, nobody, nobody recognized me. But when I started speaking English, some the the owner took took an interest for whatever reason um and hey man you know let me show you some cards in the back and he, he just sort of took me into the back and he and he showed me a box he just like pulled out a random box of cards and and, th- and there was maybe 10 cards in there and every every card was multi you know five figures card it was just absolutely ridiculous um yeah so and, and his, i mean his display cases are loaded with high-end cards he's got a, a ridiculous collection mainly basketball but a little bit of everything, some some soccer too. Well, yeah, uh, and and yeah. Kiki, uh, as he goes by, I don't know. I think that's his, his actual name, but uh, Kiki, as far as I know, he collects. He likes to collect important cards in very low condition, like PSA ones of all the important cards. And um, I've been following him on Instagram for a while, so it's you know. But it's kind of funny, isn't it, Chris? How you know we we get to know each other through the hobby over the last few years with just with the boom that we've experienced and with all the content. And then, you know, you we can have this passing conversation. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that's Kiki and, and his brother, Art, is, <laughs> as Kiki says, that my brother, let me, he says, let me go find my brother. Art is bullshit. Art is bullshit. It's, yeah, yeah. And I don't usually, we don't usually use those words on the show, but it's the guy's name uh, on Instagram. So I think that's it's his I little, think it's I don't know, that's, that's literally his name on, on Instagram. Because, I mean, it, his, his, his art is actually quite nice. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Not, the store is sort of like cards in the front and then the back room is like an art room and it's all sports art. So I guess that's the brother's art, but yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. So again, you were last on with me one year ago this weekend. Yeah. And at that time, when we were on last one, we talked about sort of the popularity of, of your YouTube channel, how it was growing. Uh, I think the word I used was like meteorically because it really had grown quickly. A year's gone by. What have you, ex- what's your experience been over the last year as a content creator and as far as connecting with your audience, can you kind of speak to that for a little bit? Uh, yeah. Well, um, well, the last—I mean, the last year has been amazing. The whole, whole, whole YouTube thing has been amazing and very unexpected. Um, I, I was not when I started. I, I was not expecting it to, to do so well. Now, I had, I had. Okay, if you want to call it a meteoric rise, that's uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it it boomed a lot earlier than I would have thought. I think the first like six months was very hard it's just you're sort of trickling along nobody's watching and you're doing anything you can to sort of gain you know a couple viewers here and there and then and then yeah like years you're like the six months to the 12 months stretch is when it just shot way up uh and then i think that's probably when i was on like sort of right at the end of that last time and and then it's it's more or less leveled off in terms of growth since then um i mean it's still awesome and i, I love doing it and have no no plans to stop ever anytime soon uh but yeah in, in terms of like the, the growth of the channel it's, it's fairly been fairly level the last year which probably kind of coincides with how the hobby's been doing in general which yeah is how i would explain it and what about the way connecting with your audience that second part of my question because i think that's yeah. really important because <laughs> as time goes by i'm sure Listen, I mean, I know you've got like, I don't know what your subscriber number is on YouTube, but it's, I think it's over 60, is it 60,000 or something like that subscribers right now? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't, it's definitely not 60,000. I, I haven't, uh, it's probably in the like high fifties, high fifties. So that's still, you know, 10 times what sports cards live has. And I can tell you that I get people reaching out to me all the time just by email or however, just with all sorts of different messages. I'm assuming Based just based on numbers, that if if I get one or two sort of uh, people reaching out to me every day or every week, you must get a lot more than that. So can you speak about just your audience and 
how you've connected with them, relationships you've built, just just kind of that that sort of thing. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's you know obviously a, a, an awesome part of the whole thing. Um, I've tried to do uh, quite a few like audience, uh, not audience. I try to you know videos where they're in, incorporate the the viewers. Like reg, I mean, my regular rollers is a, every Thursday. Uh, that's all just viewers sending me cards that they've bought and they, they find interesting. And then I just talk about it. I think I, I talk about 12 per episode and, you know, basically talk about it each one for a minute or so and describe the, the transaction, what's interesting about it or whatever. Uh, so that sort of involves the audience that way. I, I do a question and answer about once a month or so. I would actually do that more, but um, they, they, don't, they don't get, those videos don't get a whole lot of views. Um, I, I would, I, but I enjoy those a lot because that's where you sort of interact with the, the audience. Um, I occasionally do like a great collections from around the hobby or interesting collections from around the hobby. I haven't done one of those in a while. Actually, should should do one soon. But um, yeah, and I and I and then people sell collections to me via the channel, and and I've actually made a lot of friends that way. I mean, there are people have you know sent me five packages, you know, five collections at this point, and you know we're basically we, we we know each other we're friends you know we're friends it's 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 cool that way i i get a, i get a lot of random emails you know just with questions and i, I actually usually really like that sometimes I, I can't get to them all but yeah i don't know it has, has it got to the point yet where some of these people will send you their collection and say to you just send me what it's worth you know like do they put that much trust in you at this point yeah 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 and uh but i always i always i always give they're always uh free to pass uh, you know my offer and and i'll just send the cards back uh, but that that doesn't happen often it, it does happen once in a while but yeah oh, that's how all the packages are sent to me through the mail unless it's like a very simple hey there's 20 graded cards let's let's price this out up front um if it's not that then yeah most people just send me a package through the mail and say offer me what it's worth or offer me a fair price and then yeah they take it or not and us usually they take it but once in a while not right on. That, that's pretty cool so let, let me ask you this question then. Um, the hop, you know, you mentioned that your your subscribership, your viewership on on your channel has has leveled off over the last year or so, sort of in in conjunction with what's gone on in the hobby. Yeah, it, 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 I almost think that, you know, we need to sort of combat that a little bit as content creators who have audiences and and try to not let our our viewership decline too much. What have you like? So it's one thing to grow, but it's another thing to sustain. And how, what have you done to sustain? Because I, I think the fact that you've sustained is success. Not having no growth in a shrinking period of time is have, sustaining in a shrinking period of time, I think, is a win. So what have you done to sustain your viewership, your your engagement on your channel over the last six to 12 months? Yeah. Um, well, so I have my I have my my steady, you know, Wednesday and Thursday show, which is the same every week. Um, high high rollers and regular rollers, and that's sort of like my my base. Uh, that you know, and then on the my other, I, I do four videos a week, and then the other two videos I can sort of experiment and play around with. Um, and one idea that I I've started doing, I don't I don't know if it'll if people will like it, but so far it's the few I've done, I've done pretty well is sort of do videos that aren't necessarily sports card related, more sports related. Um, and then just sort of sprinkle in some card stuff. Uh, like I, I recently did a baseball hall of fame one. I was really just talking about the the players who were, you know, had a shot at the baseball hall of fame. It really wasn't a, a card video, but you know, I mentioned each of their rookies, just throw it in there. Oh, this is a Don Mattingly, you know, 84 Donruss. And the idea was sort of like, hey, if I do a, a bunch of these, I mean, there's going to be a lot more, of a pool of people interested in the baseball hall of fame than baseball cards, right? Like baseball cards is probably much more of a niche audience. If you're looking at the big picture in the world, uh, whereas lots of people are going to be interested in the baseball hall of fame. So I figured that might pull in some people who are just interested in the baseball of fame. And they're like, Oh yeah, Fred McGriff, you know, 1986 Donner. So I can have his rookie for five bucks. I'm, you know, I'm not a card guy, but maybe I should come in and, and buy a few cards or something like that. So that, that was one, one thought I've started doing a couple of videos like that. I think that's a great idea because like you said, people are going to look to look for some content on Fred McGriff. They find your channel, your video talking about Fred McGriff making the Hall of Fame or maybe they're searching Hall of Fame class. They're going to find that. And then, like you said, they're going to see that they can buy that guy's rookie card on whatever marketplace, call it eBay for a few bucks. Yeah, that might be a way to grow the hobby. Are you looking at it as a way to grow the hobby? Is that card like 
you know, to me, growing the hobby is really important. I'm going to assume it is to you too, but is it deliberate? Is it, is it, I don't say deliberate, but is it, is it one of the, uh, you know, kind of results of what you're doing that you think, Hey, this is kind of, it, it's got two benefits. Number one, it's fresh content. Number two, it's going to grow the hobby is growing the hobby important to you from that perspective. Uh, well, if, for, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a lifelong hobbyist. I'm going to be, you know, I say this all the time. I've, I've been in the hobby 30 years. I'm going to be in the hobby another 30 years. It, it benefits me if the hobby grows. That's what I would like. And yeah, any, any you know, anything that helps the hobby grow is, 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 a, is a plus for me. And, you know, plus for the hobby. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got a ton of comments coming in. So I'm gonna we're gonna run through them, Chris, and a uh, couple questions here, but a lot a lot of nice comments. Yeah, uh, Leighton Sheldon's gonna join us for a vintage update segment uh, shortly. He's been bouncing in and out, but uh, this is funny. Tyler, uh, one in the afternoon, he made left this comment said, "Feel like I'm tailgating for <laughs> a big game." Uh, cool. I hope you're watching, Tyler. But welcome to the show. B yeah. Cox says, two of the best love Chris and Jeremy should be great. Cheers, mate. Great to yeah. have B Cox in the house. Rocco Rosado is with us. Almost as always. Good evening. Let's enjoy two of the hobbies best. That's very flattering. In no particular order. Oh, yeah, that's great. Thank <laughs> you, Rocco. Jake Dahl is here. Jake's toe is here. What time? What time is it in the Netherlands right now? It's four four seventeen a.m. Four seventeen a.m. So we yeah, all... and, I, and I went and I went out last night. So <laughs> <laughs> so we all owe you a big thank you for uh, setting the alarm. No, no. I, yeah. Well, I'm I'm very I'm used to it at this point. All my business meetings take place around now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. When you're over there and your business is in uh, is in yeah. North America. A vintage card collector says, definitely two of the best YouTube channels and true ah, no, no, hobby. Yeah, I recognize that, yeah. Thank you, Vintage. Albert Jones is here. Maud Cult is here. Chris says, I drove to Starbucks in my used Toyota Camry to get good internet <laughs> signal to watch you both. Very nice, nice. Chris. Thanks good, for going good, the, good the extra yeah. mile. For sure. <laughs> Trevor Gates, howdy from Manitoba. Very good. Laura, good evening to you. Perk is here. Good to have you. Gareth Miller says, who is Gareth. this guy? Uh, All right, quick story. Uh, let me tell you. Gareth, I go way back with Gareth. We met in the uh, the card store in the, in the late 90s. So we've, we've uh, I've known each, known him forever. And uh, yeah, he, he, always, he, always, he always kills me about liking Cal Ripken. But uh, I mean, how can Cal you Ripken. Albert Bell greater than Cal Ripken? Man, seriously. How can you bug anybody for liking Cal <laughs> Ripken? I mean, he was he's such a good guy. Matt yeah. Heim, uh, glad to see Chris on the show. He's one of the good guys, especially in today's times where there's a lot of blatant knuckleheads whom don't portray the hobby in a good light. Chris definitely keeps his cool, keeps it, keeps, keeps to the content, keeps to the the facts and just the knowledge. So I'm with you on that, Matt Pime, and thanks for joining the show. Good to see you. Chris you, says, Chris Sewell, also known as the baseball card goat. We got Joe Perot in the house. What's going on, Joe? Jeff McMahon. Hobby Champ says, has Chris ever thought about transitioning his content to crapping all over the hobby, other hobbyists, and hobby content creators? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know he, I know Hobby Champs is obviously putting that up there tongue in cheek, but yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's kind of funny how the opposite of that you are. You are not that person whatsoever, which is yeah. a good thing. We need guys like you. Thank you. Thank Todd, you. Todd McDonald says, Good evening. Always a great show. And Chris is on. No doubt about it. Jake's toe actually bought some cards not far from you, Chris, in Belgium. There you oh, go. Cool. Oh, uh, on on eBay? Uh, how did he buy cards? Uh, maybe probably on eBay. On eBay, who probably? Yeah, yeah. Jim, okay. Jim wants to know who's your who's your World Cup team, Chris? The Netherlands or Team USA? Oh uh, yeah, no, it's it's Team USA. Team USA by a distant margin, and Netherlands is number two, but yeah. a distant number two. But there, there actually is, there's actually a fairly good chance they're going to face each other in the round of sixteen, so that's going to be tough. But you'll be hoping for U.S. Yeah, I'll be pulling for the U.S. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Good yeah. evening, Justin Bode, Colin Murray, Collector's Dream, Frank Estella, two of my favorites. Good evening, Jeremy and Chris. Very nice. Justin Bode says, growth is flat, but we'll take it. I think that's a, a fair comment. Growth growth is flat, so there is no growth, but we're sustaining, yeah. which is pretty good considering economic times and that sort of thing. T-Dot says, uh, Chris, your high rollers is one of the best YouTube things. I look forward to it. I think a lot of people do. Thank Loud you. Collector says, two great shows. Thank you, Loud Collector. Good to see you again. Jake's Toe asks everybody to hit the like button. Yeah, why not? Brian Adams is here. Better late than never. Good to see you, Brian. Thank you for the tip. Greatly appreciated. 
Jake says, I don't know about you guys, but I prefer regular rollers over the high rollers. <laughs> Let's ask you, Chris, which one do you get more enjoyment from? Well, so so that's a so the 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 Jake's comment is a uh, an ongoing joke in the comments of the regular rollers, which um, I'll, I'll just tell that quick. I've told that story on my channel, but uh, I, I don't know six months ago or something. Somebody wrote, uh, I, I prefer I, maybe it's just me, but I prefer regular rollers over high rollers, and that comment got like a hundred like like it, it more. It was like the most liked comment in my history of my channel. And uh, and so then it became a recurring theme that everyone, every week somebody puts that that uh, comment in the uh, comments, and and it's still it's still go ongoing. But now now they like mix it up and it'll be, you know, funny ones like I prefer cranberry sauce over you know maybe it's just me but for Thanksgiving I prefer cranberry sauce over mashed potatoes or whatever. That's but, hilarious. Uh, yeah, um, I, I like them both. I, I think I, no, I, I definitely prefer regular rollers uh, just uh, because of the interaction and it's more like down to earth. Like the high rollers is. I mean, you know, it's not like I'm out here flipping, you know, hundred thousand dollar LeBron James rookie patch autos every day. <laughs> yeah. And just so the audience knows, when we're talking about Chris and, and regular rollers and high rollers, these are the videos that you do once a week each. High rollers, you're basically reviewing the highest selling sports cards of, of the week. Is that right? Yeah, well, I've mixed, I've been mixing it up lately. It's more, yeah. Usually, it's like the the ten highest sales on eBay of the week. Or, but now I've been looking at a bunch of the auction houses because actually a lot of the high end sales are moving off of eBay. Uh, and sometimes I just throw in like a top ten card selling cards of the '80s from you know this year or whatever. But yeah, and the regular rollers is much more down to earth, like everyday people buying a twenty dollar card on eBay or a fifty dollar card on Com C or whatever it is. Yeah. Right yeah. on, right. Okay, we'll go through a few more comments. Layton's in the background uh, to come out, do a vintage update. We'll have a chat with him. Layton, you're good to go, right? Thumbs up is are good to go. There he is. All right. Michael Ham in the house. Always good to see Michael Ham. Justin Bode likes high and regular rollers. <laughs> Bastion says, Chris, you are a transparent, reliable, and humble reference in the hobby. Thanks. That's a good way of putting it, Sebastian. And yeah. I definitely agree with that. Michael Stone, uh, how is how is life in Europe treating you, Chris? Everything's good, yeah? Yeah, we 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 really love it here. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing country. Yeah, North, I mean, it, yeah. That's it. North of the forty nine says to keep up the great videos, Chris. The breakdowns in your grading videos are fantastic. Oh, uh, Bill Pro says this show is from the Blazer Division. <laughs> Anyone who watches Chris will get a kick out of that. Collector's yeah. Dream. Good morning. Perk says he saw you at the National, but you were checking in and beelining it oh, somewhere. Curious sorry. where to? I don't. So I don't remember. I don't know. Yeah, sorry. I, I always feel bad when when that happens, but yeah, I, I don't know. Probably to close a deal. Probably, Probably to, get... to close a deal. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. What What's up, Jay Z? Pushing button says Chris could start his own pre grading pre grading service. Yeah, of ten. The pushing button's good. Good commenter in my videos. Oh, cool. Very cool. Well, welcome to uh, Sports Cards Live. And welcome, er listen, you bring someone like Chris onto your show, you're going to get people who follow Chris. So I'm sure there's a lot of newcomers tonight to Sports Cards Live. I want to thank Chris for bringing some of your audience over tonight, Chris. Greatly appreciate that. And if you're yeah. new here to Sports Cards Live and, and you enjoy it, I'd love to earn your, your audience ship as well. And, uh, you know, subscribe to the channel and all that sort of thing. Uh, I collect each row in the house. What's going on? TDOS says, Chris, can you do one for errors? That would be sick. Have you ever thought about doing an error video? I actually did an error, error video not, uh, probably about three months ago or something like that. Sort of just a, a summary of all the, the major errors. It's all baseball for some reason. All the famous errors throughout the the years. It's almost all baseball. I don't I don't know why that is, actually. And that and that's a real evergreen type of piece of content that people can always go back to and reference. So I'm sure that's, yeah. a, that's going to continue to get views and be a valuable resource for people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, uh, yeah. Right on. Collector's Dream loves the vintage videos that Chris does. TDOS says high rollers is all regular, is regular, is relevance. I don't, sorry, not sorry, TDOS, don't understand the comment. For James says, good evening, good morning. We have George Waglam in the house. Chris, I love both videos, but really like when you show us your grading submissions. Very, yeah, yeah. A lot I started, of I started, I started expanding those a little bit, like, uh, yeah, so trying to add like a financial breakdown to the end, which I, I seem uh, people seem to really like. Well, and because it's always interesting, always interesting. Good evening, vintage yeah. baseball card packs. And Jake Stowe says, "Chris is how I found your show last year, Jeremy." So that's. Oh, cool. That's pretty cool. And Jake's toe has been watching uh, for a while. So 
Uh, nice. All right. Well, again, welcome everybody who's here to see Chris. My name is Jeremy Lee, the host of Sports Cards Live. And as part of Sports Cards Live, which is every Saturday night at 10 o'clock Eastern, we bring on Leighton Sheldon from Just Collect to do <laughs> a vintage update segment. And I love it when Leighton interacts with the guest of the night, which is Chris. So let's bring on Leighton and do a quick <clears throat> intro. Leighton, welcome back to the show. I, you were having a few technical difficulties there, but I'm glad to I'm glad to see you here with a with a fully charged battery. What's going on? Yeah, I'm not sure what was going on, but uh, sometimes it's just the signals in the air and you know where you're sitting with the moon and the sun and the stars. You know. Um, Do you know Chris? You me, Jeremy. Yes, I know Chris. Uh, we've done some business. How are you? Great. How are you? Like we, we yeah we met at the uh, Chantilly show. Uh, I believe so. Ra- ra- sort of randomly. I didn't mean we. Yeah, bumped into each other, and I think I bought some. You sold me some vintage commons, I think. If, as I remember. <coughs> well, Layton, Layton, Layton's vintage related, if I had to guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Layton's definitely a vintage guy, and right now, if you check out the ticker, you can follow Layton on Instagram. And Layton has a podcast called Trading Card Therapy. Layton, I love your I love your podcast. I know you haven't done a ton of episodes lately, but I want to encourage you to keep it going. And everybody, if you're not yet subscribed to Layton's podcast, give that a subscribe. You're gonna you're gonna hear some great stuff. But Layton, vintage update. What is on your mind this week? Well, I was curious, Chris, uh, and you'll see how I'm gonna tie this all together. Chris and Jeremy, but specifically Chris, because you're here just for this week only. Um, where do you like to source your vintage cards? And the reason why I bring that up is because I like to source them from everywhere, meaning from Jeremy, his neighbor, right? An auction house, a card show, the local card store, eBay, right? I don't leave any stone unturned. But what I'm getting to, Chris, is it's it feels like it's auction season, right? So, you know, Love of the Game ends tonight, REA ends next week. And these aren't plugs. These are just auctions I'm actually bidding in. So if anything, I'm hurting myself. Uh, so um, my vintage update really is I'm a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of material in auctions. And I was curious, either you, Chris, or you, Jeremy, A, do you find the same thing? B, how do you deal with it? Um, and uh, you know what I, what I mean, how do you deal with it? Do you sell off parts of your collection before you go bidding in the auctions? Um, do you actually have discipline or do you find yourself throwing back a few the final night or having a few glasses of wine or scotch or whatever your, 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 your vice is? Or to be fair, maybe the vice is the memorabilia or the cards you're going after. Um, but the first thing I wanted to talk about, like I said, was, you know, really all the vintage um, material cards and memorabilia that are available right now um, in auction houses, not even counting eBay. Um, like I said, I'm trying to bid and I'm trying to be, you know, um, selective when it comes to what I'm going after, because it just feels like, hey, if I don't get something, chances are I'll be able to find it again. Um, and I was curious what you guys think as well as your audience thinks. Well, let's start with you, Chris. Uh, well, I, I'm sort of the wrong person to ask. I, I don't, I don't bid much on on auction, uh, you know, via auction. Basically, all my inventory comes from buying personal collections. Um, so yeah, I don't follow the auctions as a buyer really. I, I sell on on them a lot, but I don't I don't really follow them as a buyer. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I haven't seen any sort of increase in. You're saying that there's like a lot more vintage uh, cards on them than there has been re- lately. No, uh, I just think that there's 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 yeah. a lot at one time, Chris. In other words. Yeah you know, there's an ending date of, let's say, Sunday, and there's going to be 3,000 lots sold, you know, do you feel like you clamor? And I can go first. I do a little bit, but after all these years, I feel like I finally have kind of steadied the ship, and I have some discipline now. And so I try try not to chase. Yeah, Um, I do buy collections like you, Chris, as well. I was able to to buy a couple in the last week. But, you know, you don't know necessarily if that faucet's going to yield, right, a few more leads out out of the sink, you know, drip if you will, your, your, your leads that are coming in. So I try to kind of keep tabs on everything. And um, I do have some bids tonight and, and collect uh, some bids at an auction that's ending tomorrow night. Um, and some certainly bids ending next week in REA. And the way that I'm kind of keeping myself um, sane is to make sure I don't overstretch both the budget, whether it be for personal or, you know, as a dealer trying to, to buy it for uh, and sell it as a profit. Uh, how about you, Jeremy? What do you think? Well, it's funny, I, you know, I was at the Sport Card Expo in Toronto a couple weekends ago, and I was set up as a vendor, and I had very few vintage cards with me for sale, mostly because I kind of forgot to bring some of my my vintage uh, pieces that would have sat in my showcases. And when I came back, and I was going through all of my pickups, Leighton, sorry to disappoint you, but I realized I did not pick up a single vintage card, probably for the first time in my life ever going to a card show. I, 
I'm, I love vintage. I have an extensive collection of it, but I think I'm at the point where, you know, I have a lot of what I want. The remaining pieces that I do desire to own are very uh, expensive. Let's say like a T206 Thai Cobb. I, I, I don't, I would love a, a 33 Gaudi Lou Gehrig. These are the kinds of pieces that I don't have yet. And so, you know, it's not, I don't know that I would have found them at the Toronto Expo, but it was interesting for me that I didn't pick up any vintage. The last vintage piece I did pick up was at the Burbank show just back at the end of August when I grabbed a 51 Bowman Willie Mays, which was kind of the top of my list for a very long time. So, but to the point, to your actual question, I like Chris, I don't follow a lot of the auctions every single month to see what's being, what's being sold on them. I know you do. And I know that there's often great value in doing so. Uh, but I guess as a collector, I'm kind of, I'm kind of just at a point right now where I'm I'm playing that whatever catches my eye game versus having a list of targets. So it's a bit of a not not the not the best answer for your question, but at least it's uh, it's the it's the answer. But can I can I can, can I follow up? Because were you saying that you you've noticed more vintage on uh, on the high end auction houses lately than in the in recent past, or or is, is that what you were saying, or was or not? No, not necessarily, Chris. It's yeah. more that there's just a lot at once. Yeah. And so when you combine that, because for example, Chris, I knew that you bought collections. Yeah. Right. I, I knew that you did something similar to me in that regard. I sure. didn't realize that you don't necessarily procure cards and buy and bid out of auctions. And so yeah. um, that's why I was discussing on here because I thought it was kind of fun. Obviously, you don't always get the answer. No, no, you want. Um, no, no. I, 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 I mean, I find that very interesting that you, you, if you've noticed that. Uh, I don't, I don't know if that's like something you know that's uh, pointing to some, some, you know, uh, something trend. in the hobby going on or not. Yeah, trend. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah. But it does lead me to, you know, I guess my last thing I want to ask you, Chris, because it's fun to be on with you. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been finding recently as I've been making not necessarily the videos that you make like on YouTube, but like let's say a reel on Instagram. And I'm trying to not focus on, and believe me, I love buying expensive collections that are, you know, <laughs> five figures, <laughs> six figures, et cetera. Yeah. But, you know, we bought a collection this week. I, I want to say it was like about 1200 bucks and it was a total, you know, like average fifties and sixties group of cards. Some of the 60 Fleer baseball were really nice. There was a couple of 58 tops, Teddy Williams, uh, number one card, um, you know, in the group. But I was curious if you see, um, you know, as you're buying these collections, um, value and sharing with folks that like, it's not always about, Hey, I'm able to buy like a Gaudi run with hundreds of cards. Right. Or I'm able to buy a 1952 tops mantle. Like a lot of times folks like us, Chris, we're out there grinding. We're buying you you bought off me $600 of vintage commons. Cause God willing, you can get a thousand bucks for it in your market or the way you're going to sell it or 800 or 1100. Um, and I was curious if you find um, value and, and has your audience, let you know that the, the videos are valuable to them when you're not always talking about the biggest of purchases. Yeah, uh, to totally. Well, I mean, so the, you know, the big purchases get, get the views, right. You know, the big purchase videos get the views, but yeah, it's not, you're not, I'm not out there going, <laughs> it's not, I'm not out there, you know, buying 52 mantles every it's most of it is that, you know, you, you make a, you know, you know, make a connection in the hobby, you, you meet a dealer and yeah, he's got, some vintage commons priced right. And, you know, he says, Hey, if you buy a bunch, I'll give them to you at 60%. And okay. You know, you can buy them, like you said, buy $600 worth of commons and sell it for a thousand. It's, it's, it's a lot more grinding like that. I mean, that's, that's almost what it's, it's almost all that. Like once in a while you hit a, a massive collection where there's like crazy returns, but most of the time, I mean, most deals I buy are with very, you know, small margins and you have to really know what you're doing in order to get it. And that, but I find that super fun. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't mind. <laughs> but yeah, to I totally agree with you. That that's that's really where that's really what the hobby is. I mean, the 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 big home run that those just don't ha happen very often. Every, everyone who finds one will probably make a video about it. So there will be a ton of videos about that stuff. So if you were just looking at YouTube, you might think, oh man, there's home run deals all over the place. But yeah, no, most deals you go to somebody's house and they've got, you know. Two two thousand dollars worth of cards, and they want two thousand. You have to explain that's too high, and then you you know you you, you offer a thousand, and that's too low, and you maybe meet at like fourteen hundred, and it's like a borderline. You probably shouldn't even buy it, but it's good enough. And yeah, that's how most deals go. 
I mean, the, the vast majority of deals are. And, and I think that's valuable. Yeah, definitely valuable for people to know about, to understand that. Because a lot of people, a lot of people are like, hey, I have a small collection. I don't even think it's worth your time. And it's like, you know, $2,000 worth of stuff. I was like, no, that's definitely worth my time. That's what I buy. That's the main thing I'd buy. You know, it's, it's smaller, you know, collections or $500 collections. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's definitely valuable. One thing that I've noticed lately dealing with people who are selling cards is that they're, they're more apt to recognize yeah. that the buyer needs to make a profit, not just for the sake of making a profit, but because there's time, effort, and expenses involved. And it's so refreshing when a seller says, I understand you need to make money, but they don't just say, I understand you need to make money. They say, I understand that you need to make money because you're going to put a lot of time and effort into this. And that's what some people maybe don't realize, but that's why when Chris says it's worth 2000, maybe we settle it at 1400, but I probably shouldn't buy it anyway. It's because that's, it's going to take him more than $600 worth of his time to realize yeah. that $2,000 if you're following my math. So is there a, for, for both of you, Chris and Leighton, I'll ask you first, Chris, do you have a formula you run through in your head? Do you consider the hours of time, the expenses in terms of, you know, fees to sell on eBay or setting up a card shows, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it first. Yeah, 100%. Definitely. I mean, I don't have like an exact formula where I'm like, oh, this is going to take 3.5 hours. And but yeah, I mean, the, the time is more important than I mean, it's not more important. It's, it's as important as the margins. I, I uh, I mean, all you have is your time, right? But that's really all you got. And that's the thing you, you can't get back. That's the the thing. If, if, if we had infinite time, we could all be gazillionaires, but we, we don't have infinite time. So that's the thing you can't give away. So if you buy a deal and you make a lot of money on it, but you, you, you break it down and your per hour breakdown isn't good, then that was a bad deal. Yeah. How about you, Leighton? Do you have a, do you have a, I mean, you've been doing this a long time. Do you have a, it worked out in your mind how to approach these discussions and how to kind of work in the fact that it's going to take time and time is money? I think I do. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure if it's perfected or not. Yeah. I'll let you know at the end of the run. Um, but uh, I, would, I would close with this and I'll let you gentlemen kind of, you know, uh, run with it from here. But think about this, Chris, and to your point about time, right? Um, and... I don't care what the number is. You could say it's a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, and certainly, you know, we want to try to keep it where people get the point. Imagine you found a great collection, and you know it was a hundred thousand bucks. It was a million dollars, some big number. Think about how much easier, at least in my perspective, and I just came up with this. I've never talked about this before. How much easier would it be to raise the money from either another, you know, finance person or someone in the hobby that you know, as opposed to saying, you know. Instead of needing a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, I need a hundred thousand hours, or I need a million hours to tackle this said collection I'm going to buy. Chris, I would go to the ship, I'd start walking on the plank, and I proverbially would jump right off because there's no way I'm going to be able to ever recover from that. I'll be chasing my tail forever. So, per your point, uh, gentlemen, time is something that you cannot replace. And even if you try, especially you know if if, if you've been trying to hire as a small, medium, or big business in the last 12, 15 months, COVID aside, is challenging. So if you take on a collection, with, which is, it's very laborious, um, you know, you really, it, it could make things very difficult for you. Forget about to make money, but to get out of that nasty cycle of not having enough time so you could focus in on other areas. Uh, I, I like that, yeah. Well yeah, said, so. well said. All right, Leighton, um, you good? anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up the Vintage Update segment? Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you to you, Jeremy, for having me on this week. Thank you to Chris for uh, participating and chatting uh, some vintage cards for a few minutes. Um, and Chris, when you're going to be back in the area, I probably have some more vintage cards that are up your alley. As yeah, well are as you buying collections as well. So, are you going to be at the Chantilly shows anytime soon? No, we'll be at the Philly show in December, though. Which is, oh, I'll, I'll be, I'll be there. Up. I'll be there, and, and next Great. weekend. Well, yeah. we'll, we'll see oh, you yeah. there. Looking forward to it. In two weeks? No, next weekend. Yeah, next week. Uh, I think I don't think I'm trying to think. I think I'm still. Uh, tired from the thanksgiving turkey but i think it's next week right? <laughs> yeah that's right <clears throat> all yeah. right thanks layton cool take it easy guys yeah take you care. too man yeah all right well thanks uh layton for joining uh we're gonna go through some comments chris Lo lots more coming through yeah. uh so first off uh jeff mcmahon says if you're new to sports cards live subscribe jeremy has a great channel thank you jeff mcmahon appreciate that michael stone says speaking of grading chris what is your number one grading company for the PC, and he goes on to say, 
Are you going to try tag, which obviously is, as my audience knows, I am, uh, I am deeply involved with tag grading now. So um, start with the, his first question. If you're, what is your, uh, sorry, this one here, what is your number one grading company for your private, for your personal collection? Uh, my number it's, it's, it's PSA. I, uh, I mean, they're, they're just the industry, I, you know, I'm more of like a, I, I want to see established things going on. So for being PSA it just makes the most sense. They're just as cheap as everyone else. The resale value is the highest. I, I particularly like the PSA labels. They're very simple. Um, and they, they highlight the, to me, they highlight the card. Um, you know, they've got their issues, but most of, most of my PC cards are PSA. I, I definitely have some, have some SGC as well. Um, I'm trying to think I might have a Beckett or two, but pr probably not much. Not um, uh, yeah, I don't mind Beckett, but my, my PC's vintage. So there's just not, you know, Beckett's not the, not the right call for vintage. Right. Um, um regarding tag. So I'll, I'll just, I'll tell, you know, what I know about tag. So I, I didn't know of them, but I ran into you at the national last, uh, this, what, six months ago. Um, and you were with a couple of the guys from tag and, and, and they gave me like a little, I don't know, informal presentation. And, and I, I was, I was legitimately impressed. I mean, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not somebody to sort of jump on, on the new grading company bandwagon. You know, I don't, I don't know that, you know, how tag is doing so far, but I'm more somebody to wait, wait to see that they're established, but, um, and then I'll sort of get involved. So I haven't done anything with tag. I haven't sent them anything or anything like that. I haven't bought a tag card or even seen one since then, but, um, but I was very impressed with the presentation. I'll, I'll say that it was a, it was a, a legitimately interesting, like, Oh wow. I should <laughs> make a note to, ch to check up on that and see what's going on <coughs> wow. because, because it does, it does seem like something that will, it will be bringing something new to the hobby that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely get a tag slab in your hands here in the near future. Yeah. So you can check it out, check out the digital image and grading report, the, the transparent slab, the transparent grade, um, yeah. all the things that differentiate tag from the uh the manual grading companies and at tag we're not grading vintage yet we're just doing 2000 forward so you know okay. you probably find a few cards in your collection to give it a try and just no uh, yeah it yeah it's, it, i'm sure it's worth you know uh, i remember i don't actually don't i don't actually don't remember the slab but i remember liking the slab a lot because it also really highlighted the card um from what i remember it's just very clear right there's like nothing very yeah very very clear no no paper label transparent yeah. flip which is pretty cool yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, and, you know, people have been calling for automated grading a long time. And, you know, we've seen a lot of pretenders in that space, we'll say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I would say I'm, I'm without knowing much about it, I'm, I'm rooting for it. Appreciate that. Well, th yeah. thanks for that. Um, OK, cool. Let, let's keep on <clears throat> moving. Uh, Collector's Dream says would love to see Chris's personal collection in one of his videos. That's something yeah. that I think a lot of us think about doing. Have you uh, given any serious thought to that? I mean, you've done you've done videos on some of your Cal Ripken stuff that I've seen. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've never done like a full PC video. That's a good idea. Yeah, I've done sort of like little little chunks of it. Good, good. Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it is in chunks, so it's easily digest. For if I were to do one video on my personal collection, it would probably take fourteen hours just to get <laughs> through showing each card. At, at least I couldn't imagine doing that. Yeah, uh, it would have to be broken up into like twenty parts, probably. Yeah. Just to, so you're not, you know, my, my, my videos are already 90 to 120 minutes long. How long can I go? Um, <laughs> yeah. Mod Cult says, can't wait to check out Layton's podcast as, as I too dabble in vintage. Collector's Dreams had great vintage talk. Michael Stone, I usually buy local shows. I know a few guys that give me deals on vintage. Uh, Collector's Dream auctions for the rare stuff. I buy most of mine at auction. Jake Dahl prefers to buy vintage cards and autographs. I always lose at auctions. Justin Bode wants some vintage hockey. Lots of talk about vintage from when Leighton was just on with us. Uh, Colin Murray says low pops populations equals high prices, and that's that go that goes uh, without saying. That, that that's a pretty that's that's economics right there. And Chris, we were going to talk a little bit about population, like pops versus comps. There's a, at card shows, everyone's always talking about comps. What's the latest comp for this for that? If it, you know, I was at the local show this today, my local monthly show. And I was asking the guy about a card. There were none sold on eBay that he could check, but he saw two buy it nows, one for $450, one for $350. And he was kind of relying on those as, as an indicator of value. And my thoughts were, well, you could ask $10,000 for the card. It doesn't matter what you ask. It's, it's what is it going to sell for? 
how do you look at a card that doesn't have a lot of comps, but might have items for sale on eBay that are way higher than you think the card is worth? Do you consider those asking prices at all when valuing the card or kind of assessing a card's value for yourself, either to sell it or to buy it? Uh, I generally no. like that, that, I think that, yeah, the, the comps thing is often a big struggle because people just don't know how to use it properly. Yeah. A list price means nothing. I mean, you can list, like you said, you can list anything you want for any price and nobody lists things too low. You know, only people, you know, if you're going to list something on eBay, nobody would list it too low. You might list it at a reasonable price, but most people list things way too high. So list, list prices are, you know, you can almost throw them out. Now, you, if it's your only data point, you might have to sort of use it, but um, completed, you know, you got to go by completed sales. That's, that's the only actual useful data point. And I would say like, if you don't have any completed sales, it's more use, more useful to find a similar card with a sale than a list price of the exact card. A list price of the exact card really tells you nothing. I, I mean, a lot of dealers list things at 3X, 2X, just because they don't care if it sells. So they're just going to list it there and, and let it sit. So that, that doesn't tell you anything, you know. Yeah. If there's well, like a hundred of them and they're all listed the same price, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you uh, completely. If it if it if it's just an asking price, it it's it's irrelevant to the discussion as far as yeah. I'm concerned. His comment back to me was though, well, the cards out of fifteen, two of them are on eBay. If you want one, that's what you have to pay. So what should I ask for mine? I said, well, you know, one hundred and fifty bucks probably, not three fifty or four fifty, but. Yeah, and a card, a card. I mean, that, that. Yeah, I mean, a card that doesn't for a card out of fifteen. There's probably not a lot of buyers seeking that specific card out. Like if it's a, if it's a, I don't know, a Jean Morant card out of fifteen. Well, Jean Morant has a thousand cards out of fifteen. So it's not like if if you know, it's not like they're seeking that specific. I mean, maybe they are. Probably not. So most likely, there's a lot of other options. So it's not like it's not like that's the only option on that card. It's like they can just go next door and find another Jean Morant that's out of fifteen. Exactly. It's yeah. uh, that's when it that's when sometimes it does become a seller's market for sure. Uh, yeah. Adam Holgate says I've lost a lot of interest in videos showing really big dollar cards. They aren't really relevant to my collecting. Still yeah, a lot, a lot of people mention that with high, high rollers. It's a it's like yeah, this stuff. It was fun to watch once, but <laughs> it's like. <laughs> And now it's it's it seems to be the same. It's always a Michael Jordan Fleer yeah. eighty six, right? It's always the same right. card. That's why that's why I try to mix it up with with uh, yeah. I try to mix it up now and then because it, it does get repetitive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Perk says, where should someone looking to get started in buying and breaking out collections go to find collections for sale? That's the golden ticket question right there. Because if if there was a clear answer. I mean, everybody would be going there to buy the collection. So what advice would you give somebody with, with all that said? Uh, well, so uh, yeah, this, sorry to, this won't be the answer you're looking for, but it's, it's all, it, for me, it's all word of mouth at this point. Like it, when I first started, I was really hustling. I mean, going to garage sales and Craigslist, which, you know, nine out of 10 don't pan out. Um, you know, going to card shows, looking for dealers who would try to like bulk out some stuff it was really tough to find but over time it's just it's just become word of mouth almost all the collections i mean i get a lot of collections through my channel but more than half are just word of mouth hey my buddy sold you a collection last month you know he said you were fair so it's i think it's a snowball effect like you have you're gonna have to hustle at first and then once you once you once you get a few going then they'll recommend it and then you know a lot of people have repeat you know, a lot of people are repeat sellers as they'll sell collections. So that, that's how a lot of it comes in. Exactly. I think the best advice is you've got to hustle in your own region, whether that's, you know, putting an ad on Craigslist, I guess, in the U.S. or Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji in Canada yeah. or whatever it's called, wherever you are, kind of online classifieds that you're buying. Hopefully someone reaches out to you and then the snowball starts rolling as they start to tell their friends and you get referrals. And, you know, the more kind of first first interactions you have the more referrals you'll get from them and the bigger and faster you can grow that end of your business so that's yeah. kind of the and that that would answer Lashwine's uh question too although he wants to he takes it a bit further he says would you have a recommendation on the dollar value amount of inventory plus cash on hand before going full-time as a card dealer uh whew. 
It's a tough um, question because I mean everyone's resources are different, right? Yeah, I would say it all. Yeah, exactly. I would say it all depends on your personal situation. If you have, if you can afford to go for six months without doing, you know, having a great income, then I would say you don't need a lot. But if you can't, then uh, you know you do. I, I don't. I started with very little cash, very little cash, but I had a I had a massive collection. So I sort of, uh, you know, I'd been collecting twenty years when I started dealing. So I had, in I had inventory to to start. Um, I would say it's a good industry that you can start part time and, you know, go to a show once in a while. You know, you don't need to quit your job or anything. You can start part time and see if you can snowball something there. That's basically what I did. I was doing it part time, and at some point, I was like, you know what? I'm doing pretty well with cards. I'm enjoying it more than my other career. I'm just going to commit all my time to cards. And I was I was fairly confident when I actually made that switch that it was going to work because I had already been doing it part time a long time. So I would I would almost recommend you know doing it that way unless unless you're in a really great financial spot where you don't don't even need that yeah yeah it's a tough question to answer <laughs> i think it's just everyone's situation is gonna yeah. be so yeah. unique but i mean listen you can start small with a thousand dollars of inventory you can start modest with twenty five thousand, or you can go big and you know it depends what you're financing what your financing situation is like as well or your your finances are how, how set up you are yeah. um Let's uh, let's keep going. Jesse just said, I just watched Jeremy's interview with Patrick Bet David. Great content. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, Patrick Bet David was on the show with me uh, close to two years ago now and uh, would love to get him back. We'll, we'll definitely look into that. Uh, John Wee says, trading cards for other cards, diversifying or consolidate is the most fun for me. There's a bit of competitiveness to win deals. And I remember every card I've traded away and traded for. My gosh, I cannot do that. Not even close, but it yeah. is nice to, to diversify a little bit. Anything you'd like to add to that comment uh, from John, Chris? Uh, no, if that's what you're into, that's awesome. Go for it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Brian T already took a shot at me, says, so when, when does this shyster get his high-end cards and goofy tag slabs? So he's, ta he's calling my guest a shyster. That will earn you a permanent block from my channel, Brian T. Uh, thank you. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Just, you can insult me. Just don't insult my guests. I didn't even ever. get it. What was the insult? Called you a shyster. I don't know. It's, uh, I think it was more a shot at me than you. So don't even okay. worry about it. Okay. Kurt Cavanaugh says, speaking of grading, has anyone graded with KSA for vintage hockey? I'm in the U S curious if they're more prevalent in Canada. Yes, Kurt. KSA is more prevalent and it's a Canadian grading company. I've uh, been around for a long time, like been around since the early to mid nineties, I would say. Chris, do you have any experience with KSA as a grading company? Uh, not, not a lot. Um, yeah, I see, I see them once in a while. I, I don't, I don't know much about them. I, I know they're into hockey, but I don't know a whole lot about them. Yeah. KSA. And that's just because they're in Canada. They get mostly hockey submissions for sure. Yeah. Uh, vintage card collector says, what does Chris find his most popular raw to grade segments are? Low mid grade, vintage, modern, non sport. What 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 kind of graded cards does your audience like to watch you speak about the most? Uh, I don't know that there's a specific a specific one that they like. I think I think people, there's collectors in all 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 of them. Like people like low end vintage a lot. I think that's a very affordable way to get a you know historic card. But people like modern high grade stuff too. I think it, I think it's all over the all over the place. Yeah. I, I think that makes a good sense. Good sense to me that there's going to be some something out there uh, for everybody. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about because the comments are coming in fast and furious. And uh, I want to thank everybody for those. Um, Gareth does say KSA is Canada's version of GMA. I don't know how long GMA has been around, but I got to think KSA has been around a bit okay. longer. Well, I, Gareth knows what he's talking about. So I'll, I'll take that one. I, want, I, I just wonder how long GMA has been around. GMA has been around a long time um, and there's a, I think they have a niche market, uh, but I don't know that, you know, the average industry person would consider them, you know, credible, not, not that they're not credible, but, you know, would, would think a GMA slab would add much value. I, I don't know if that's the case with KSA, but. All right, fair enough. Let's, uh, let's go to Perk's question for you. Uh, thoughts on the soccer market now that the world cup has started and where you see it going short term long term and i'm not going to speak I, I have a thought but let's uh let's get your thoughts on soccer uh in the context of world cup being uh, upon us right now yeah i don't i don't uh i well i would guess that sh soccer will see a, a short term a short term little boost with the world cup uh, otherwise short term I have, I have no idea 
long term, I think I think soccer is a promising sport. Uh, you know, biggest, most popular sport in the world. It's got a very small market share compared to the others. It seems to be growing in the U.S. I, I don't. I think it has a long term potential. We'll say I, I, I'm not much at predicting. <laughs> I found when I try to predict, you know. I, I can predict in sort of general terms. I think generally long-term soccer is a promising prospect. Yeah, I, I'm with yeah. you. I, I, you know, it, because it's such an international sport, it's got fans all over the world. Yeah. I wonder though, because it's in, it's in so many countries that maybe, you know, some countries that aren't as well off as North American countries and European countries and some Asian countries, and perhaps cards aren't even something that they think, or maybe they are, maybe it's one of the, the luxuries they have. I don't know, but I think that, uh, it's definitely a popular sport. There's definitely collectors of it, it's hardcore collectors in, in the U.S. and Canada, Europe, of course, and um, you know it's got a rich history as well in the vintage realm of things. It's a very complex niche to understand as far as yeah. cards goes. Do you yeah. have much experience yourself dealing in vintage soccer cards? Uh, well, I've been I've been uh, investing in some of it. Like I, I buy some long term, I buy some vintage soccer for long term stuff. Actually, hasn't been doing very well so far, but you know, it's not long term hasn't played out yet. But uh, uh, no, it, it is a very confusing because it's not like the other sports where there was tops and and that's all that was going on. You know, with soccer, there was like brands from all over the world, and they were super obscure, and you know, they were tied to a bread company or whatever, and they're they're all sorts of weird sizes and shapes, and you know, I think Pele has like. 40 rookie or he has like 30 rookies but they're all super rare and they're all obscure oddball stuff so yeah it's a, it's a much more com it's much harder to to get a grasp on vintage soccer than the other vintage sports yeah that, that, that's my understanding as well and one thing i want to just talk about in terms of the soccer market and you know the peaks and valleys of it i remember having a conversation like six to eight months ago with somebody and i, and I said and they were talking about loading up on on soccer for the world cup at the end of the year like right now and I said, I don't think that's the strategy. I think, the strat I think right now is the time. If you're in it to make money, I think now is the time to sell your cards because all of the anticipation for the World Cup that people have been waiting four years for is it's six months away. We're in the final, like those, those final few hours of getting to it. And right now there's so much hype for it six months from now. It's kind of like Hall of Fame announcements. You know, you know that the, you know that, People often think that, oh, I'm going to wait for that player to get into the Hall of Fame. Then I'm going to sell their cards. Or I'm going to wait for that player to pass away. Then I'm going to sell their cards. And my response to that always is, no, no. For the Hall of Fame, you want if you're in it for the highest return, you want to move out of your cards when the announcement happens or just before the announcement when it's being when everyone is, is speculating that that player is going to get announced. So in like January of the year for the following summer's induction. And the same thing, I think, for soccer. I think that same thing happened for uh, for soccer here, is that the best time to sell might have been about six months ago when everybody was gearing up for loading up for now because the demand was so high for people who were thought that they were way ahead of the game. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, that's completely true. Like, Well, I mean, you know, obviously in any one instance, anything can happen with the market and things go crazy. But generally... Yes, you you want you don't want to you don't want to wait till after the event. You want to be selling as you run up to the event and and the anticipation around the event. That's when card prices usually get the highest. It, it's like you know Patrick Mahomes you know wins the Super Bowl. His card prices were actually the most expensive right before he won. Yes, um, and then and then he wins, and then you know everyone kind of forgets a week later. <laughs> and 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 the, the Hall of Fame is a, a, a notable one too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, Mod Cult says, uh, "Where can I find Chris's YouTube channel?" It is easy to find. Mod Cult just type in "baseball card collector investor dealer." That's the name of it, and uh, I'm sure if you type in "baseball card," it'll be one of the first to pop up. So, for everybody listening, if you are not somehow not yet familiar with Chris's YouTube channel, again, "baseball card collector investor dealer," and then as he likes to put, say on the end, in that order, <laughs> not. Yeah. And I had to ask Chris last time, I said, why is it in that order? Because I, the assumption was that, you know, you're a, you're a collector first as far as your activity, then investing second is second most important to you and dealing is third most important to you. But you corrected me on that. Why don't you explain why you, because again, he always says, welcome to the baseball card collector investor dealer in that order. Why is it in that order, Chris? 
Yeah, uh, I guess that's something I, have, I haven't made clear because I, I under, it, it could seem what you're saying is the case, but it's really those are the order I became each thing. I, I became a collector in 1988 is how I rem is how I remember. It might have been 1989, but I remember it as being 88. Um, and then I was a collector for decades. Uh, at some point along the way, I started realizing that I had learned a lot just being a collector that I could sort of invest in cards and. I understood, you know, investing in cards is, is tough. You, you, you gotta, you gotta have a lot of knowledge. So I sort of understood, okay, I can start investing a little bit because I've been in the hobby so long. So I became an investor as well. And then, uh, and then finally, at some point, I was like, you know what? I love cards so much. I want to make this my career. And so I became a dealer. So it's it's the order I became each thing. Today, I'm I'm really a dealer. Like I mean, I'm all three. I do a little investing, um, and I I uh, you know when I say investing, I mean I buy cards as investments. And I do a little bit of collecting, but mostly most of what I do is is dealing. But uh, I, you know, I like to think of myself as a hybrid of all three. But if if you've like followed me around day to day, you'd, you'd say I'm a dealer. Yeah, I'm a hybrid of all all three as well, and probably in the same order as you. Collector first as a kid, you know, growing up in the '80s. Yeah. And I became an investor as a consequence when I got my very first Beckett magazine for Beckett Hockey magazine, yeah. and I remember seeing that all these cards that I had that I was sorting out on, on my shag carpet bedroom floor now had some, my Steve Eisenman rookie was, was worth $60 or whatever. Back then you could buy a TV for your bedroom for 60 bucks. I thought I was rich. So yeah. I became, I kind of became an investor second and I did become a dealer third. So I am also, I actually should rename my channel to <laughs> Sports. hockey card collector investor, investor dealer. Yeah, yeah. In yeah, that order. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, right on. Yeah. Uh, Collector's Dream said, Chris, you sold your 52 tops mantle. Will you try to get another one? Uh, I would I would love another one. It's been a while since I had one. I haven't had one since it it it, it, it shot way up. The last one I sold way, I mean, embarrassingly low compared to today's market. But I've, I've had a, I've had a couple, but it's it's been a while since I had one. I think the last one I sold was a um, a BVG two for thirteen thousand, which would probably be six times, you know, five six times that or so now today. Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't win them all though, right? Can't hold on. Can't all. I mean, I did I did fine on that, you know, that particular <laughs> card. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, Jake, uh, Jake's toe says, Chris, show and tell us about a card you have closest to you right now on your desk. That's uh, they're, well, I'd have to, I'd have to get off screen. They're all, they're all right there, but yeah, uh, I don't, I don't have, I don't have a lot of my exciting stuff with me in this room. All right. Uh, and Justin Boat says, yeah, sell the rumor buy the news. There you yeah. go. Similar, you know, just in terms of watching the, the, the markets move with, uh, with anticipation of events happening. Lash Wine says, Chris, do people approach you with their Com C collections to buy their portfolios? Yeah, quite, quite often. Um, and I, I haven't, have not bought much. Uh, uh, I don't, I just, price wise, people are generally asking too, way too high. It's like a lot of, um, because you know the beauty of Com C is it's like the one place you can sell your two dollar card uh, online. I mean, it's really the only place, in my opinion, um, that you can sell you know for for a reasonable rate um, based on your time. But yeah, a lot of people approach me with that, and they'll just have like a, a lot of two dollar cards, and you can't be paying fifty percent on on two dollar cards. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, expect that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I once sold my port on Com C. This goes back several years ago. And the buyer, I think, mentioned to me that they usually like to put in an offer of 10% of the current asking price on the platform, which I thought was a little bit too low. I mean, you know, I already had my cards, well, I already <laughs> yeah. had my cards priced very competitively. So to take 10%, I thought was, you know, of an already competitive price. I thought was a little a little bit too low of an offer for my liking. I must have sold it to somebody else. I don't recall at this point in time, but uh, but it's definitely a, a great platform for for moving cards of, of even even different sort all values. But they are to me a great platform for lower value cards as well, like that that you know two to twenty dollars sort of uh, level. Yeah, well, ten ten percent of of a reasonable price is that's crazy low. Uh, but I'll, I'll counter by saying that most people don't price their things competitively on Com C. They, they price them way, way too high. So what often will happen is there'll be a, you know, a bunch of, there'll be like a $5 card. They'll have it priced at 12 and they'll be asking 50% and you're like, yeah. well, 
that were, you know, the numbers are just too far off. You do see a lot of those games, not games, but those strategies where people will way overprice their cards, have a sale, a con, a sale on going on all the time yeah. that brings it down to a price that's still, right. still maybe, you know, 50 to hundred percent higher than, than fair market value. But I guess it's uh it's just con- simple consumer psychology or complex consumer psychology <laughs> at that yeah. point. But all that said, I found some great deals on there and, and give some great deals on there as well. Yeah. Uh, running right now at 20% off my portfolio for Black Friday sale. So, hey, go check it out on on, uh, <laughs> yeah. on, on, on Com C. Uh, next question is from Jesse R. Says, how about when it comes to prospecting, for example, Mbappe winning the World Cup again or being the highest scorer of the tournament? I, I think he's asking about, you know, prospecting on these future events that might happen. It, it's similar to prospecting any sport for any yeah. reason. And I think that... Uh, I, I I feel like Mbappe has a lot of value built in already, and you always have to be careful about that baked in value of players. You're when it comes to prospecting, which I do not do. I would recommend finding somebody who everybody isn't looking at. Everyone's looking at Mbappe. Try and find a the unknown if you can, and then maybe hedge your bet and and you know also collect or invest in a player that you think has uh you know a more steady chance or a more a a better chance of being a steady performer whose values won't go down kind of i'm a big fan of hedging when it comes to that sort of thing any comments on that chris yeah well i'm like you i I don't i don't do any i I mean i used to try back in the day and i I never i never did well so i I don't do any prospecting at all i don't even try it um you know mbappe he's not really a prospect he's more of a sort of established young star i'd say but Still, like you said, his prices are too. He's he's priced as if he's Pele. So, if you're thinking like long term with Mbappe, he's got to be the best player of all time for card. You know, it's like he it's already there's so much more downside than upside on someone like Mbappe in the long term. If you're talking about in the short term, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to gamble there and say maybe he has a great World Cup, maybe his card prices will go up in the short term. That that would if you if you have that feeling, that might be a, a, a reasonable thing to try. Uh, that's not something I personally do. I, I see that more as gambling, but you know that doesn't mean that there's not validity in it. But yeah, yeah. Not, that's not really my thing. Not your thing. So Todd Van Poppel, Eric Caro, <laughs> well, uh, Brian Todd Van Poppel, Taylor, I probably did invest in it one moment back. In. But these guys, yeah, Scott Erickson, uh, yeah. these guys, they didn't work out for you, did no. they? Yeah, <laughs> me yeah. neither. Me neither. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tom Mayrant, welcome to the show, says, how much do you think vintage Star Wars sets will increase in value between now and 2027, the 50th anniversary of Episode 4? Uh, well, I, I, Tom is a good uh, good uh, subscriber. Um, I, yeah, I don't, this is not, the, I don't predict these sort of things. I mean, Star Wars has potential, I would say. There's upside with Star Wars uh, and, and Marvel. But uh, yeah, I I don't know more than that really. I would say it's got it's got it's got upside, but I wouldn't necessarily predict it's going to go up or down. I'll, I'll take a shot at it on yeah. on, uh, on behalf of both of us. Well, on behalf of myself, I'll say because I think that you know the question. I think it's a good question because we are you know four or five years out from the fiftieth anniversary. I'm not thinking about it yet. I'm guessing a lot of people aren't, except for those real hardcore Star Wars fans and loyalists but not which i am which i am by the way i'm a i'm a hardcore star wars fan but but maybe not from the angle of the cards so i think that it's going to be similar to soccer where i feel that the best time to offload your soccer cards was about six months ago definitely not right now probably because too many players are disappointing and teams are disappointing their fans right now so as soon as the tournament starts if you have as much of a chance of a card going up in value as coming down in value, probably a better chances of it going down in value because every few days the, 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 the field reduces by 50%. And now there's no more attention on, on those players. So yeah. with, with the star Wars cards, I would think that now might be a good time to look at them for that reason that the 50th anniversary is in 2027, but the closer we get to that anniversary, the worse the strategy becomes because more and more people are cluing in. And then don't think you're going to sell them for the maximum at the on the date of the 50th anniversary. No, the, the maximum is probably going to be like that same six months before the 50th anniversary would be my, and this is, I'm just guessing, but this is based on 40 years of observing the hobby as well. So I think I might be onto something, but I could be out to launch on this as well. What, what are your thoughts? 
Uh, yeah, I, I would say that's what I would say too. If I if I had to guess, I I, I don't know that I would uh, be a comfortable guessing. I'm not sure how big an event that'll be. I guess that'll first they'll make it a big event. Yeah, no, yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah. I mean, that that well, what you're saying is as a general rule is exactly right. You you want to sell leading up to the event, not as the event is going on. But yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, Sexton's Kentucky card, but you know you have Chris Sewell on your show, and you see all these new names in your chat. Yeah, so I, I, I know this, I know Sexton very well. Yeah. Well, I just, so thanks again for bringing a lot of your audience over, Chris, tonight. And yeah. uh, again, welcome to Sports Cards Live. If you if you're coming over because you are are one of Chris's many loyal subscribers, uh, Sexton says, "Hey, Chris, are you seeing a huge shift from ultra modern to vintage in the industry?" Uh, yeah, one uh, well, ultra modern as as I did a video about this today. Ultra modern has really tr dropped off, and um, I, I don't know if I'd seen seeing like a shift. Just just values have really plummeted in, particularly with ultra modern. And dealers such as myself have to pay really really low to protect ourselves because you can you know. And so I think I think ultra modern is losing a lot of. Uh, interest at the, at the moment. I don't know if I'd say there's like a shift to vintage. I think vintage has just been steady the whole time. I mean, vintage went up and, and came down a little bit, but not, not to the crazy levels that we saw with, with ultra modern. All right, cool. Let's go to the next question. Then we've got this one from uh, well, comment really from Chris C says population counts are not accurate because if the same person submits a card three times in order to get a 10 PSA counts, the previous nines also, I feel they're inaccurate and overblown. And that statement is completely correct unless the submitter sends the card back in the same slab and doesn't crack it out themselves before sending it back or when the person who cracks the card out takes the old flip, the old label, and ships it to PSA so they can remove it from their population report. I have to think 99% of people don't actually do that. And I agree with Chris C., that the population reports are overblown. I used to think it was by like five to 10%. I now think it's more in that 30% range. I think that I, I agree with Chris. I think they are uh, way overblown. What do you think, Chris? Do you have a gut feel for just how inaccurate P like, and it's not gonna be tens. It's only gonna be nines, eight, seven, sixes. Cause no one's taking a 10 out of the holder to try and get an 11. Cause there's no 11, <laughs> uh, you know, very few people are breaking a PSA 10 to try to get a BGS. No. 10 or black label. Yeah. So usually, yeah. So what are your thoughts? Uh, and I've had this discussion going on a couple of years now and, and I'm going, uh, my, my percentage that I feel is higher than it used to be. As I just said, w what's your gut feel? Uh, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. It was definitely overblown a little at, at a minimum. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think off the top of my head that it's like crazy. Uh, although it, it could be, and like you said, it's definitely not a problem with tens, at least with PSA. By the way, it is a problem with like BGS 9.5s. People are cracking BGS 9.5s all the time trying to get mm -hmm. tens. And they're even cracking tens trying to get black label tens. So the BGS pop report, in my experience, the BGS pop report is like you can't rely on it at all. PSA, yeah, you're, I mean, you're, you're obviously onto something here. Uh, I, I really wouldn't know. 30% 30, 30 seems like that would be a lot. But um, I mean, if you're dealing with like a PSA 9, you know, well, <laughs> I guess if you're dealing with high end PSA nine and it's a massive difference to a 10. Yeah. I mean, I personally don't crack a lot of stuff. I just haven't had much um, luck with it. I've, I've very rarely found where you crack a card and you resubmit it and get a higher grade. It happens once in a while. And, and if it's extreme, I'll do it, but I rarely, I very rarely do it. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are people who do it a lot more than you. But not a lot more than me, of course, um, is what I meant. But yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm certain. I'm certain there's there are people who've made a living uh, just doing that. Yeah, I, I'm certain. I know. I know some of them. So that that definitely does go on. But I'm like you, Chris. I've never played that pop and resub game. Try to get that higher grade. Yeah. I'd rather just get out of the card. I or or just hold on to the card if it's a card in my collection. The right. card's still the card. Uh, you know, I don't need, I don't, I'm not as into just an arbitrary grade being slapped on it for the sake of, of having a, a grade that might be half a point or a point higher. Um, yeah. un unless it comes time to sell, then perhaps it's different, but I, I have a 25 year horizon on my collection. Yeah. Uh, it used to be a 50 year horizon. It's down to 25 <laughs> now uh, right. as I, as the years go by. Yeah. Chris C says, I need more vintage. Recently picked up an SGC Hank Aaron in, in the same grade as a PSA counterpart for far less. I buy the card 
not the slab. Yes, that is the way to do it, Chris yeah. C. Exactly. Uh, one ounce Moz says, my time machine is almost complete, Jeremy. A seat will cost you 10K. Chris, <laughs> your seat is free. Sweet. I mean, I'll take that offer. I will <laughs> yeah, pay no 10K kidding. for of a course. seat in the time machine. <laughs> yeah, that's an easy one, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a deal. Sounds yeah. like a deal. Uh, thank yeah. you for the offer, One Ounce Moz. And yes, welcome to the show. Uh, Tom says, what do you think is one of the most undervalued alternative rookie cards? So I'm not exactly sure what the definition of alternative rookie card is, Chris, but I, I have a feeling you might know what Tom's getting at. So I'll let you run with it. Yeah, I like I like the alternative rookie because often the like uh and there's lots of good ones. I mean the fifty uh the fifty four top tank Aaron is obviously a, a rookie card everybody wants and it's sort of out of the uh out of the uh, price range of, of most people. But he's got he's got a nineteen fifty four uh oh man what is it the the Braves something with the Braves uh, he's it's a it's a taller thinner card and it's it's just way cheaper and it's from nineteen fifty four and it's like ten percent the price and it's actually even rarer. And it's a nice looking card, and and that I think that's a good one. Um, a lot a lot of players have alternative rookies like that. You can get, you just can't afford the uh, the killer price on the you know. Yeah, it makes me sort of think of the uh, the tops test Wilt Chamberlain from uh, you know that being an alternative. I know uh, you've got a Jean Beliveau Laval Derry card for as far as hockey goes, and a, then of course I don't know that got, one is, what's that one that that's uh, Jean Bel. You know Jean Beliveau? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, his rookie card is from uh, 1953 Parkhurst, but I think he, I think it's a 51. It's called the Laval Derry, which okay. uh, it's funny because Laval is a city in Quebec that I'd never been to until about a month ago when I went for the card show there. And yeah. I was looking around as I'm going in the Ubers, I'm looking around, where's Laval Derry? Where's the place that, that made these cards back in, back in the early 50s? But um, that's what it is. It's <laughs> been some dairy company in the city, in yeah. the city or town of Laval, Quebec uh, in the 50s. So it's a black yeah. and white card. Um, I much prefer his 53 Parkers. That, that's a beautiful piece. Just, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Rome, you rock says, what is the best sale you made where after you sold it, it then completely tanked in value. <laughs> I mean, uh. <laughs> yeah. Like, and before you go, I just want to say that it, like, if you are somebody who deals in, in the ultra modern, it's basically every card you've ever sold that tanks in value a little bit after you sell it. But not, not all of them, but but many of them. Uh, what's your what, what comes to mind for you, if anything? I know it's a put on the spot sort of question. No, yeah, nothing's jumping out at me as like an obvious one. I, but like you said, I mean, I don't I don't hold anything ultra modern, um, unless it's like a really obscure thing that I think is undervalued for some reason. But that's pretty rare with ultra modern. So I mean, I buy a lot of collections, and a lot of it's ultra modern. I just sell it immediately. So yeah, there'd probably be a lot to pick from in, in there. Uh, but no, no, no one thing is jumping out at me off the top of my head. No, oh, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Jake's toe does say I've never bought off Com C because they're asking too much. So let's just clarify that it's not Com C asking too much. It's all their customers like me who sell on their platform that yeah. set our own prices. But I would challenge that uh, comment, Jake's toe, and say that there are sellers that actually ask reasonable prices, and I've. I actually did a price adjustment on my on my cards about I had 700 cards. I adjusted the prices like a week, like seven days ago. And I'm now down to under 350 cards because I slashed my prices because I want to move them. I, I want to move the cards. So there's probably a few other people like me on there that are looking to sell, not just store their cards there. Yeah, well, so he's got a, he, he definitely has a point, like a lot of seller. But this happens everywhere on eBay, too. You, you, a lot of sellers just price things stupid high and, and are fine to just sit on it. Why not? Like there's no, uh, you know, maybe they get lucky and make a crazy sale. And so they just price things really high. Uh, so there's a lot of that on Com C for sure, but it's not all of it. And you can, you can definitely find, I mean, you got to remember on Com C, you're not paying any taxes, you're not paying any sales tax, you're not paying any shipping. Well, you, you might have to pay shipping or you can sort of navigate it in your own, however you want, but so you can save a lot of money there. So if you're buying like a $5 card, it's much better to, Buy it for six dollars on Com C than five dollars on eBay, um, for example. In, yeah. in in my in my you know probably let's say yeah no I, I agree. Kevin yeah. says uh, Chris, I think I remember you saying that you grew up in the D.C. area as did I and worked at a card shop there. Curious to know the card shop name and did you ever attend the old Shaw shows? Uh, so it, the card the card store it's called House of Cards. Uh, uh, sorry, Hall of Fame Cards. There's also a house of cards in that area. Hall of Fame cards. It was in Rockville, Maryland. It's actually still there. 
um, at a, at a, at a mall. It's still there. And that was in like, that was like 96 to 99. I, I worked there. Um, the shop shows. Yeah. I, re I remember those. I, um, I mean, I think he still puts on shows in the area maybe also, I'm not sure, but yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, Chris C says, Chris Sewell, if you could go back in history and buy a card you passed on buying, what would that be? Uh, well, I, 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 I passed on a 51 mantle PSA three and it was, it was a, I, I very rarely like seek out PC cards because most piece at this point, most PC cards are just part, I buy a collection and there's a card in there. I'm like, oh man, that's a cool card. I'm going to keep it for my PC. So I very rarely like go saying, I want to, I'm going to, I want to buy this card for my collection. Uh, but there was one exception. I, had a, I was looking at a 51 mantle. It was a PSA three or four. And this was probably four years ago and it was like three, three grand. And yeah, should have bought that. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say for me, it's like every time I saw a 52 yeah. tops Mickey mantle over the past 20 years yeah, and just yeah. didn't buy it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I still don't have, I don't have a 51 man. I don't have, actually have a 51 or a 52 mantle on my PC. That's, that's a missing hole in there. You have a hole. You definitely have a hole. I still have my, yeah. I have my 51 Bowman, but I've never owned a 52 tops and I'd love to, but uh, it's gotten to the point where, you know, for a low grade a PSA one or two, you're you're coming up, you're over fifty thousand bucks. It feels like for yeah. a nice copy of though. I don't want want one that's been crumpled up and then laid flat and slabbed. I'd yeah. like it to look presentable, and you're you're at least fifty thousand dollars now for one of those. So yeah, it's no, tough. those really those really jumped recently. They did. They certainly did. Uh, Krista Snow says Chris Sewell is that dude. Loves cards. Obvious to see. Nice change up. Acknowledgeable. Down to earth. I guess knowledgeable, down to earth, truly great dude for the hobby. Great show, guys. Thank you, Krista Snow. Thank you. Yeah. Colin Thank Murray you. thinks that uh, Star Wars is very hot now, not in four years. I wish, I wish I could see the future like you can, Colin. That's a clear, <laughs> that's a clear, clear view, buddy. I mean, Star yeah. Wars is good right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll just say Star Wars is good right now. They got a lot, a lot of good stuff coming out. Yeah, I've been watching all the miniseries myself. Inglorious P says, Chris, are there any sports or non-sports that you are speculating on? Any TCGs, any trading card games? No, yeah, TCGs. No, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about TCGs. When I when I get them in a collection, I, I just uh, sell them immediately. Non-sports. Um, I mean, I have you know, if there's like a really old sort of uh, iconic person. I, I, and, I, and it's in decent grade. I'll hold on. Like I have a, I have a Walt Disney card from the thirties. That's like a PSA six. And that's like, Oh, you know what? I'm just going to sit this in my long-term hold box and see what, see what it's worth in a few years. Cause I think it has a chance to, you know, but um, not, not targeting anything specifically, but I have like an early um, Mark Twain card from like 1895, something, something like that. I, I, I like stuff like that. I find that stuff interesting. So, and I think it has, yeah, well, it's probably more that I like it than I think it has upside, but I'm going to, I'm going to convince myself it has upside so I can hold on to it for a little bit. <laughs> no, and you know, what? I have a collection of these historical figures myself, people like Charlie yeah. Chaplin, Walt yeah, Disney. Yeah. I, like, I like this stuff a lot. And they're really rare. They're rare. Albert Einstein. I mean, all these guys, all, all these, all these people, the queen has the 52 tops look and see queen yeah. Elizabeth who just passed away. I love all, I love that stuff. To me, cards are more than just, you know, sports card collecting, they are, they, they are a way to kind of own history in a yeah, way, you know, sure. and, and it motivates you to learn about the, the subjects of these cards as well. If you're interested, if you're just owning cards so you can tell people you own them, that's one thing, all the power to you, but it's a nice, it's also a nice thing when you own a card to read about that, the subject, read about yeah. that player, read about that historical figure, that musician, that actor, whatever it is, maybe listen to their music, watch some of their movies or, read up read up on them and what their what you know their discoveries if they were explorers whatever i mean there's there's cardboard for all these historical figures i love i love that little section of my of my personal collection yeah no and then and on on the uh on the regular rollers usually maybe not every time but usually once an episode or so there's some obscure athlete from like not always an athlete but some obscure athlete or historical figure from the 60s and it's a card i've never seen before and you know somebody picked it up for like two dollars and you're like wow that person was significant. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's cool to see. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Uh, JTQ99 says, thoughts on Opeachy baseball being undervalued compared to Topps baseball. The pop counts are a fraction of Topps. Good question for you to kind of contemplate Opeachy versus Topps and 
how the values uh, uh how they how they play out yeah uh that, i think that's probably i don't know I, I i haven't looked at like uh i don't know if you're talking about like graded cards or, or raw cards i think and and what decade specifically you're talking about six six seventies um eighties probably yeah i mean the, i think the, i think the, i think they are worth quite a bit more in high grade uh i would i would guess although i, I don't know th that off the top of my head but there's certainly a lot rare, but I think there's also a much bigger market for the tops cards. I think, and that's a nostalgia thing, right? I mean, just Americana, you know, baseball yeah. being such being, being America's pastime tops being part of Americana. I think it just makes sense. It's similar to Opeachy up here for, for hockey versus tops. You know, everybody wants the Opeachy, not the tops copies because that's what Canadians grew up on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in hockey, you see it, right? I mean, hockey, the Opeachy is worth way more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, rounding the corners with Darren says, are CSG perfect tens common at card shows? Don't see them very often on eBay. Wondering how they compare to PSA 10 and BGS black labels. I just can't speak to it. I don't know that I've ever seen a CSG perfect 10. Chris, can you, uh, can you help Darren out with this question at all? I've seen very, very few. I don't even know that I've seen any. Uh, and CSG is clearly trying to create their own black label with with that like the elite 10 grade um so i i, I imagine it's going to be and like just like with bgs you just never you rarely rarely see them i imagine it's going to be the same with csg they're just not going to give those out very often yeah which yeah. which is i'm sure you know part of their 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 long their strategy mark santucci says how was laval how far is it from the city the show was great mark and I don't know, 10 minutes from the from the city of Montreal, I would say, if I remember correctly. I like this comment from UK Living. No idea how I ended up at this part of the internet. Great work, though. <laughs> That's one hell of a slappable head. Well, UK Living, if we ever see each other, I invite you to give me a not too hard of a slap across the head. Yeah. Matthew Fine says, how concerned are you about overproduction that is reflecting 2020 interest, but is only ref but is only reflected in 2022 sets? Will people leave after losing their shirts in 2021 on 2021 investments? So just to clarify, I think what Matthew Fine is getting at is that a lot of the planning that the card companies do for their production is based on the current situation, the current market demand. 2022 sets were probably being planned, I guess, in about 2020 or at least 2021. But we had we had the pandemic delay. So maybe there is that two year gap where the, they were already getting ahead of themselves and planning future sets. So if you're planning production for 2022 or 2023 during the boom years of 20, really 2021, how is that, are we gonna see an oversaturation of product and how will it affect people? And will people leave after losing their shirts in 2021? So uh, I yes. just, I wanna take one quick stab at that and then it's over <laughs> to it. you. But, <laughs> yeah. but my thought is that if you're gonna, who's who are the people that would leave that would have all their money tied up in, in, in unopened product or even open product. It's really going to be people who came in more recently. I would think who are, who might leave because they might not realize that the hobby isn't always on this upward trajectory like this. It's going to go up and down. So I I'm not, I don't have any concerns really about that because I know that the hobby has a great foundation of collectors who are going to be here no matter what the market's doing. Um, but th those are my thoughts, Chris. What about you? And anything, anything uh, unique? Yeah, that well, you have? I mean, I think we we're already seeing that, right? I mean, isn't uh, you know the famous shots from a year and a half of the targets and the WalMarts, and there's just empty shelves completely, except for you know one or two like weirdo products that nobody wants, but it's completely empty product. Nobody can get anything. People are showing up in lines. And there's fights breaking out in the parking lot. And now today, there's you know products stacked everywhere and they can't sell it. Right. I think we're already seeing that a little bit um, with like th they're producing product today as if it was 2020. Right. And so I, I think, uh, I think your, your, your first question is, yeah, that that's, I don't know what their plan is. I don't, I mean, I don't follow this stuff, so I don't know what the, the manufacturer's plan is for 2022 sets. Um, but yeah, they better take that into consideration. I would say. Uh, well, people, yeah, your second question sort of asking, I mean, the way I, the way I see the, the, the hobby in terms of like the boom and then the, the drop, um, I think that, yeah, if you went back to like 2019, there's a, the hobby is, had been flat for a long time and had a very, very steady, solid base and wasn't going to do anything. But then we saw this boom, which was a whole bunch of reasons for why that happened. 
whole bunch of people entered the hobby in all, you know, investors, collectors, dealers, in all sorts of paths. Yeah, a lot of them are going to bought at the peak and they're they're down a lot and they're going to leave. But you don't you don't need them all to stay. You, you need a chunk of them to stay in that way. And I think they will. I think enough people will have entered the hobby and been like, hey, this is a, this is a cool hobby. I want to I want to stick around. And so whenever this whole thing finally levels off, um, there'll be more people in the hobby than there were in 2019. That, that's how I see it. Um, as a, it'll be an, it'll be a net positive. I think yeah. that's uh, I think that's pretty pretty well said, and I and, and I agree with that. Um, you know, we talk about overproduction. Maybe we'll have another uh, fifty-two tops uh, dump them in the river situation. <laughs> yeah. uh, to, uh, to dump to, all those twenty nineteen prisms or whatever it is. Bring bring the supply <laughs> down. Bring the supply yeah. down that way. Just dr drown them. Maybe, maybe that's how we can do it. Yeah. Speaking of production, we have, so first uh, Laura just put in the chat here. How is Fanatics going to adjust production? But a little bit earlier. Uh, Matt Pime said, Chris, what are your thoughts on the emerging presence of fanatics? What do you see as the potential effect of their expected mass marketing campaign? Yeah. So again, not, not something I really follow. I mean, I would, I would, I would assume they're going to market like crazy all over the world and their goal is going to clearly be to grow the hobby significantly. I guess I hope that they're a quality company and are successful. Um, I would imagine that, you know the cards I deal with are not are not ultra modern, so I don't know that Fanatics is going to affect the vintage market much, and so I think I think that'll always be be solid sort of. But yeah, I don't I don't I don't know I don't not following sort of what their game plan is. Yeah, and, and you know I know the questions directed to you. I tend to answer the questions too, even when they're directed to you. Oh no, yeah, please but, go uh, for it. <laughs> I mean. I think that a mass marketing campaign can only really marketing is there for the purpose of building business. So if, and I believe the fanatics are good at marketing, so it should have the, imp the impact of growing the amount of people in the hobby. And that can only be a good, I think that can only be a good thing. I hope it's only a good thing. And hopefully those people that come in, come into because they, they enjoy the hobby. They enjoy collecting, putting a set together, chasing their favorite team player, whatever they like the looks of the cards i mean all these reasons that guys like us chris have been in this hobby since we were little kids i mean i'm, I'm 42 years in this thing i don't see myself ever stopping a lot of you know a lot of people will rebut that by saying yeah but kids today have they have ipads and, and iphones and and you know online playstation and this and that they don't care about tangible cards anymore I've seen a lot of kids at card shows and card shops lately so i don't no, know if i true. buy that current technology argument anymore how about you uh well i mean no I, I think we've seen some kids i think i think it's hard to draw in kids like you can't draw in kids the way you did in like 1988 um but yeah i think i think i think fanatics is gonna i mean i'm sure they're gonna they, they spend a lot of money right <laughs> so they're gonna be they're gonna want to grow and and there are for sure pockets of the world that have not been that there's a lot of room for growth i mean i live in one so i i think I think there's, I think there's certainly potential for for big growth. I, I don't know that I would predict it or not, but there's definitely potential there. Uh, you know, it's I, I like that you're just you're not willing to really uh, predict the future. And uh, because, when I predict, I'm always I'm wrong a lot. So <laughs> that's the I think that's a good approach though, and it's part of what yeah. makes you such a likable uh, YouTuber in that yeah. you just you just give the facts, you don't uh, mince words, and I know that's what I one of the things I enjoy about uh, about your content and what what got me watching you uh, when I first found you a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. Raj Dillon says, are you loading up on Ovechkin cards? That's a, it's actually a good question. It's a, it's a good question right now. I'm sure you're not Chris, or maybe you are. I mean, you're mostly baseball. Are you loading up on Alexander Ovechkin cards? No, but that, that's because that's because hockey's not really my thing, but um, yeah, no. So no, I, I have an Ovechkin uh, upper deck in my PC, but that, that's it. The thing about Ovechkin is that, you know, he's the one who's threatening Gretzky's all-time yeah. goals record. He's, you know, he's 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 scheduled to get there in three seasons or so if he doesn't get hurt and all that. Uh -huh. And I think I think it's that same phenomenon we we're talking about with Star Wars, with Salt with World Cup, with Hall of Fame. All the all the excitement for him catching Gretzky's record. The, the peak of that excitement, we'll see two peaks. The first peak happened. It was last year when he had a 50-goal season and kind of proved that with three more of those, he can get there. And people were getting very excited. His cards took a big run up because of that. But now, 
is that already built in? Is him getting there already built in? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. So the second run up on values of his cards will be when it becomes obvious that he's going to get there, barring injury, of course. Yeah. And that's not going to be for two and a half seasons or so, uh, you know, if everything goes according to the plan. So I'm not loading up on Ovechkin cards for investment purposes, but to be honest, I'm buying the auto Ovechkin card because he's an all-timer. He's a generational talent. He'll go down as a top 10 player of all time, probably. And I want to have some cards of his in my collection. So um, I'm not loading up to invest, but I'm adding, you know, a few nice auto patches along the way. There you go. All right. Yeah. Thanks for letting me go off on that one. Uh, <laughs> here's one for you from, from your friend, Tom says, uh, after Mini Minoso, I think it's Jim Cott and Tony Oliva, who do you think will be the next long wait player to make the Hall of Fame? Yeah, so I, this is this is the one that I play. Like I, I play, I predict the Hall of Fame. I try, I, and I'm not good at it. I get it wrong a lot. But I, uh, I, uh, I, I got caught right. I had, I bought a bunch of cots, uh, like before, and I was like, maybe he'll be a surprise, um, you know, Hall of Fame. And he kind of was. I don't think people were predicting he would make it. Um, so there, there's a lot. There's, I mean, Lou Whitaker. So the way the Hall of Fame works is it's in. A, I don't know if you know this. It's in like a. Every three years, they rotate who's eligible from from the from the uh, old timers committee, like uh, people who are no longer on the regular ballot. Um, and so those are the those are the fun ones to to predict because those can be big surprises. And and to your point earlier, like about um, about when to sell, you know, when when is the peak? A lot of people say, oh, save it till he makes the Hall of Fame, which is not the right mentality. First of all, a player who's like obviously going to make the Hall of Fame will not see a, a boost in value if they make the Hall of Fame. Because we all, everyone knows it's going to happen. But a player who is not expected to make the Hall of Fame and then unexpectedly gets voted in, like a Harold Baines recently, his key rookies will see a big jump, right? And so that's I like to play that game a little bit. Again, not not successfully. It's not a major part of my strategy. It's just like a fun side one. And I did get Jim Cott right. But um, yeah, there's like Lou Whitaker is is like a is like a, a, a no brainer. Uh, Tommy John is probably a good bet. There's a uh, yeah, I don't know. There you there, go. There's two, there's two names for you. <laughs> well, there you yeah. go, Tom. I hope that uh, hope that's uh, good good enough uh, for you for as far as answers go. A yeah. um, couple comments here. Kryptonite says Chris Sewell's YouTube channel is great. Thanks for all you do. And I mean, uh, thank I'm gonna, you. I'm yeah. going to echo that for sure. Uh, Collector's Dream says, "What a great interview with Chris, who has the best YouTube channel ever." And listen, I have a YouTube <laughs> channel too, and I'm going to agree here with Collector's what? Dream that uh, Chris's YouTube channel is definitely if not the best, one of the best ever. So, uh, of course, Chris, definitely, definitely keep it up. Keep it on the topic of, of Crosby, Hobby Ch or of Ovechkin. Hobby Champ says, Sidney Crosby is a sneaky buy with all the eyes on Ovechkin. That's that's a that's a, an astute comment right there from Hobby Champs that I, I greatly agree with. So Chris, let me ask you, let me, let me ask yeah. you a quick question as a, uh, as a hockey guy. So I, I remember, I haven't, you know, I remember a few years ago, uh, and, and maybe it maybe been more than a few years ago, but I remember there was always the Crosby Ovechkin thing where they're like the two best players in hockey for a long time. And I always thought Crosby was considered better in, in other people's eyes. Has that sort of switched recently? It's funny in the history of those two players, since they came in the league in 2005, Cro they've, they've kind of juxtaposed a few times. Crosby was, was far and away ahead as far as values goes yeah, uh, and then he got hurt. He was out for a little bit. Ovechkin played well, took over. Crosby came back, and now Ovechkin. You know, here we are, twenty years, almost twenty years into their careers. Unbelie unbelievable when you think about that. And Ovechkin's cards are more valuable as yeah, far as by a lot, right? By a lot, right? By a lot, I would say by yeah, by a lot right now. I'm I'm not exactly sure, but you know, thirty yeah. percent anyway, kind kind of thing. And that could change again and again. It's it's a lot of it is because of the excitement that people realize, hey, Gretzky's one thought to be untouchable record of 894 career goals is now achievable by Alexander Ovechkin. Yeah. And I mean, he's, I think he's got, he's coming up on 800 right now at 790, something like that. I believe he's about to catch Gordy Howe and become number two, number two. Okay. which is unbelievable in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the thing, one of the key differences you said, you, you started off your, your question by saying, I always thought that 
Crosby was considered to be more, to be better. And my response initially was going to be, he's considered to be more Canadian. And that's a big part of it. He's Canadian. Ovechkin is Russian. And so, you know, the Canadian, uh, his Canadian, his Canadian ness is, is what a lot of people like that. You know, a lot of Canadians, especially interesting, like that he's Canadian. That said, the hobby's pretty open to these uh, these Russian players, including Ovechkin. I mean, he's like I said, he's he's going to become an all. He is an all time great. There's no no doubt about that. He, I think we can consider him the best goal scorer of all time over the course of a career. Now, Mike Bossy might be considered the best goal scorer, but he only did it for like nine years. Ovechkin's coming up on twenty. So, you know, how do you yeah. how do you make that comparison? I think you give them both a lot of credit, is what you do. Nice. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I, I remember I remember being surprised recently when I saw how much more Ovechkin's rookie was more than uh, Crosby. It is surprising. You're right. I mean, Crosby's got more cups. He's got more international uh, uh, accolades. But Ovechkin's a goal scorer. You know, yeah, Crosby's yeah. an all-around player. So it's a, it's, it's kind of one of those things too. But let's yeah. let's keep on going on. Uh, yeah. Are you Jerry Hotch wants to know? Are you any interest in sports caster cards? Those those oversized ones yeah. from the late seventies. Where, where do you where do you where do you fall on those? Uh, I mean, I think they're they're fine from a personal standpoint. I don't like oversized cards. I like I like my cards all fitting together. <laughs> Me too. Me too. So, yeah, <clears throat> I'm I'm with you. I don't have interest in though. I think they're cool. I'll look at them, but I don't have any interest in owning them because again. I have very few oversized cards. Usually they're tall boys, the Joe Namath rookie, yeah, Lou Alcindor. Yeah, or, yeah you have that, yeah. Right? right? Those are welcome in my collection, but I'm not a fan of book. I saw a beautiful booklet card at the local card show today, a beautiful Martin Brodeur, uh, two, two, two vertical booklet with two big chunks of stick. And it was it was fairly priced. I just couldn't buy it because it's like it's just it's so awkward in, in your in your collection. So yeah. I'm not a I wonder, I wonder how I mean that's how I feel, but I I wonder how many people feel that way. And that, that's like a reason not to collect oversized cards. So probably it's my reason. And I think yeah. it's probably, I'm not alone, but I think there's a lot of people who just think that's a cool piece. Yeah. I'm going to buy it. And they're, they're right as well. It's just, what are you comfortable with in your, the way you store your cards and all that. It, it just sure. comes down to, we're all so different in how we yeah. approach this hobby. Right. Question for you from Brian Adams. He says, "Chris, if you could change one thing in the hobby, this is the this is such a great question because yeah. it's, it, it's great because uh, people love to ask it. And but in any event, if you could change one thing in the hobby, what would it be?" Well, I was actually asked this in my Q and A because I'm I'm glad that I was because it's hard to come up with on the spot. <laughs> yeah. But I, the, what I came up with then was, uh, I, I think most dealers are are very you know honest and they're and they're looking to they're looking to just make an honest living, but there are the occasional ones that will try to, you know, rip you off, low ball you, uh, these sort of things. And I wish those would go away because th- that actually just makes my life harder. It's not good for the hobby people, you know, you get ripped off once and, and you're more likely to leave. And, and, it, and like I said, it makes my life harder because a lot of people just assume, you know, I'm, I'm trying to low ball or rip off, rip somebody off and you have to deal with that. Yeah. So that's what I would change. I would get rid of, I would get rid of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one to get rid of. Uh, Alan S. throws out that Gretzky has 1,072 goals, though, but he must be including his WHA goals, which are fair. It is sort of fair, but uh, anyway, that, that's a that's a, a discussion for another time. But appreciate the uh, the yeah. added detail, Alan yeah. S. And and a correct detail, I'm sure. I haven't done the math, but I'm sure he's 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 right about that. Colin Murray says Ovechkin is the all time purest goal scorer to live. Period. And I mean, I can I can definitely get behind that. Uh, Darren wants to know: Is Jim Tomei a Hall of Famer? Well, he's in the Hall of Fame. He's in the Hall of Fame. He's uh, in. Yeah, I mean, he, I, I think um, he's one of those players where I don't know that while he was playing, he felt like a Hall of Famer. But when you look at the, the career numbers, he's clearly there. I think he has over 600 home runs, which is like that. That alone, there's nobody. There's nobody without five, you know. There's nobody who reached 500 home runs who's not in, and I think he has 600. Yeah. Good. Colin Murray says Ovechkin has a personality and Sid doesn't. And I've, I've heard that before. Sid's, yeah. a, Sid's like the consummate pro though. He's just so serious about his business and Ovechkin, he likes to party and get out there and, uh, you know, c- celebrate. Uh, Chris C says Fred McGriff should be in the hall of fame. It's a joke. He isn't. Do you agree with that? I, I like, I like the Fred McGriff one I, it, uh, because I remember, so I, I really liked Fred McGriff when he was a player. And I think he's a, uh, I think it's, I think he's a borderline case, but 
Um, I actually just talked about him in my, if he hit 493 home runs. And I, I just said 500 home runs is a lock. There's no player with 500 home runs. Who's not in except for steroid guys. He's got 493 and yeah, he got, you got to put him in. I think he's, I think he's, he's there, but I, I think it's fair to put him as a borderline case. Yeah. yeah he's, he's on the, he's, he, I think he's got a shot this year. We, you know, he might be in, in a month. So cool. Cool. We were talking about kids in the hobby earlier. Michael Stone says about 40% of my sales it shows is oh, to kids. So that's awesome. That's really cool. nice to hear. Yeah. Jesse R has this question. Do you guys believe the market is just following other market trends? Most card charts are matching both the stock and crypto where they had a run up in 2020 21, then an 80% correction from 21 to 22. I'll let you take a stab at this uh, first, Chris, if you'd like to. Uh, I, well, I don't follow this crypto at all and i don't know a whole, i mean i have money in the stock market but not just really like safe boring stocks i mean i don't really i don't really i mean i'm sure there's something to do I, economically i'm sure there's some ties i don't really see cards as like stocks i think they're i think it's a totally different thing uh so economically i'm sure there's some ties but i think it's sort of indirect yeah yeah, yeah. but what, what would you say i mean i would start off by by saying like the hobby's the hobby, you know. It's not the stock market. It's not crypt. Crypto is air, as far as I'm as far as I'm aware. Crypto isn't even like a thing. We're, we're it, it, it's abstract make believe. So, I mean, what is it like? Like who? Like I I hate t- trying to tie sports cards to crypto. I understand that there are some people who made a ton of money in crypto in 2020, 21, and maybe took some of that money out and put into sports cards, and now they're not doing so well. So they left, and people blame that for for a lot of what's happened in, in our hobby in the last, you know, six to 12 months. I think there might be a bit of, a bit of that. I don't know for sure. I haven't seen the, the evidence or I don't know that anyone has seen that evidence. Uh, but um, I think it's, I think the, the hobby is more likely to be aligned with the stock market. Cause that is general, you know, generally an, an economic measure that we, that you can use to, to assess how, how people are doing financially, how much debt is there, interest rates, all these things do have a play into overall economic supply and demand. Um, all that said, I would, I would not. He he starts this. Jesse starts off doesn't start the question, but he says he says most card charts. Well, card charts are very specific to either one card at a time or some mix of cards, like an index. And unless you're collecting that assortment of cards exactly that's in or close to it that's in that index, I don't I don't. I don't put a lot of stock into what the charts tell me because I'm, I know what I want to pay for a card. And if I believe there's value in that card today, yesterday, you know, in 2021, 22 or 23, I'm probably going to buy that card either for my collection or because I think it's priced too low and I'd be silly not to buy it, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I just don't really care what the charts are telling me. I've said this on my show a thousand times now, Chris, I buy cards through all economic conditions. I will buy cards, not economic, all hobby conditions, I mean. I will buy, if I'm broke, I'm not buying cards. But I'm buying cards if they're priced high, medium, or low because I, I'm a card guy. I, I always want to be, I, I, just, I just love cards. So, um, you know, I, I guess, the, but the spirit of the question, do you believe the market is just following the other market trends? I don't think it's that correlated because you think about what happened in, in you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone thought, the hobby was going to tank because cards were worthless. All, all they, you know, you can't eat them, sleep in them, wear them, nothing like that. So, but then again, the hobby went, went ballistic from, from at that point forward. So I like, like Chris, I don't like to predict things. I don't, I don't know. I don't have the evidence. Do I believe the market is just following other market trends? I mean, there's got to be a correlation to the, to the general economy. I don't think crypto, maybe crypto is, is correlated to the, to the stock market and the, the base of the economy, but I would never pin the hockey, the, the hockey, sorry, the sports card hobby to crypto ever. Cause again, crypto is make believe. Yeah. I think I, the crypto one, I don't see, I don't, I don't see much ties there, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. But the stock market, maybe just because of the general economic situation. Better question. If I have uh, Patrick, but David back on the show sometime, he often opines on the economy and where things are at. Um, I'm not an economist, so I'm just 
you know, I'm not fully comfortable with the question anyway, but, uh, well, but thank- it, well, yeah, one thing, I mean, you know, uh, <clears throat> and, and you're this way too. I've been in the hobby decades in those decades. There's been ups in the economy. There's been ups and downs in the economy and bo- big booms and the hobby's always been fine. Like, yeah. In, in, in the big, in the big picture. Agree. All right, let's move along. Brendan says, Chris, I love your grading returns predictions videos for the amount of money you spend on grading. Don't you think the grading company should provide grading notes of some kind? Quick plug for tag. You get a full grading report when you grade with tag, but that's, and that's why tag does it because the other companies just don't. I had, I had Nat Turner on the show uh, just over a year ago. And I asked him, will you, will you give report grading reports? And I listen, things can change. But at the time, he basically said no. And I just, I wasn't happy with that answer uh, because it just doesn't seem fair to me. You're, you're, you're paying a lot of money for this information or for this grade. At least give us an idea as to what's, what's you don't go to, you don't take your car into the repair shop and they tell you it's going to be $1,000 to fix it and they, they don't tell you what they're fixing. They tell you what they're, they tell you what's wrong with it. So they, you know, even if they're lying to you, you never know. But, but uh, the question is to you, don't, do you think that you should be getting uh, grading details on your cards? Uh, well, so for me, for me personally, I generally don't feel like I need it because I, I'm submitting a lot of stuff. And uh, but you know, there's definitely at times when, like, I had I recently had a Jordan rookie, and it came back um, all not altered. It came back. I don't remember what the term was, but it came back. They can't grade it. And I, why not? Like, I I needed to know. I needed to know that. Like, is this can I send it to another company? Like I need to know some sort of diesel, especially on like high, high end stuff. Um, the only time I, I really want the notes is when it's like way off, the grade is way off. And I'm like, why, why is this a six when I thought it was going to be a nine? Uh, that, and that happens once in a while, but not a lot. What I will say is that whenever I make these videos, I get all that in the comments a lot. Like people will say that this comment a lot. So I assume that that's something that a lot of people do want. And, and I imagine uh, yeah, a lot of collectors really, really want would want that a lot. I, th- I think a lot of people do want it. it. It's it's that whole the old question is why did I why did it grade the way it did? And the yeah. fact that we you just don't get that answer. Beckett gives you subgrades, so you at least know where to look, but you still don't know yeah. wh- where exactly. So um, I'm a big fan of uh, of of transparency when it comes to grading. I, I I don't think the hobby overall is a big fan of it yet, but I think that uh, maybe that's to come. Uh, Bob's big boy says, Chris, in, in the day and age of influencers and high production value editing, Chris Sewell's YouTube channel is a testament that quality hobby content doesn't need hype. His passion for the hobby comes through. Ah, thanks. Uh, th- that sort of compliments the, the, you know, one of the nicest you can hear. That is about as nice of a compliment as you can receive as a content creator. When it, yeah. when they speak to your passion people, you know, I, I'm, I'm a guest on podcasts all the time. And the question I often get is what advice would you give someone who's starting up out a podcast? My immediate, my, my aunt, it's usually three words, consistency. Cause you, you know, you want to put out consistent content, authenticity, again, just be authentic in, in, in your love for what you're talking about and, and passion. <laughs> if you're passionate yeah. about what you're talking about, it's going to, people are going to, are going to, I think they're going to respond to that. So um, you're, 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 you don't speak with a lot of passion. I mean, let's right. You're, 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 <laughs> no, you're, <laughs> no, no, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I assumed, cause I, I mean, in person, I, I laugh all the time and I'm, I'm goofy. I love dumb jokes and, but on, on my channel, I'm very monotone and uh, I'm not sure why that is. That, that's just sort of when I, do recordings i just feel more natural doing that um and i i kind of assume that that might be a big problem with the channel like i'm boring um yeah, yeah i mean my voice i hate well, i hate the sound of my voice but i think everyone hates the sound of their voice uh and and i'm just very you know not very colorful i, I or i don't feel very colorful when i speak but yeah that hasn't been an issue at all i, I it hasn't been an issue at all how let me let me totally change it up for a moment. You're you're running your card business from the Netherlands. The card business is mostly North American business. Yeah. Uh, and I'm using the term business here versus hobby or collecting and that because you are. You're a full-time card dealer, semi-full-time YouTuber as well, documenting your 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 hobby <laughs> experience. Yeah. How do you I mean it can be hard enough to run a business in in the geography that the, that that it's really occurring. 
it's got to be easier now than ever with with computers and internet and all that the global economy but how like t- share with us how is it for you running your business from the netherlands uh when here you are waking up at four in the morning to do a podcast with me tonight <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, it took me a while to sort of figure out because I've been here four years now. Um, and the first first year, I wasn't really doing much. Second year, I sort of started the channel, was trying to figure out. And, and the second year, there was the pandemic, so I couldn't fly to the, the States at all. Um, but over the last two years, I've sort of gotten a handle on it. And it's just sort of I go to the States every every couple of months, usually for two weeks or a little maybe more like 10 days. I'm actually leaving tomorrow for uh Monday for, for tomorrow for me, uh, Monday for you. <laughs> Cause uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm leaving on Monday to, and I'll go over there for 10 days around the, the Philadelphia show. And I have a bunch of collections I'll be buying. And, you know, my, my model is really to buy collections. That, that's what I am really good at. And that's what I really love to do for me. The fun is having a pile of cards and, and now I get to decide what to do with them. Um, and that's also what I've become really good at because I've, I've just been doing it so long. And so while I'm in the States for a, on a 10 day trip, you know, I've, spend a third of my time buying. I spend a third of my time sorting and I spend a third of my time sort of distributing to where it needs to go. Um, I use, I use com C a lot. I use a lot of the, uh, the auction houses, um, to sell stuff. Uh, I use some of the vaults and then, and then I bring some stuff back here with me to sell on eBay. And I also have a lot of lo- local people that I sell to in, 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 on the East coast as well. So I've sort of developed, it's working. I, <laughs> it's working for now. I hope it continues to work. Do but you, yeah. but do you have to keep awkward hours considering you have a family, you know, you have a wife, you have a, you have a kid, kids in the Netherlands. Do you, do you keep different hours than the rest of the people, your neighbors and your friends there and your family? Um, I've always been someone who just, well, I mean, I have a seven year old, so I, th- that sort of control, that sort of controls my hours really. Um, no, I mean, I only do two things in my life. I, I play with play with sports cards and I spend time with my family. Those are the only two things I do. So, but I, that's not a complaint. I like th- that no. takes up all my time and I love both those things. So sounds it like works. you're living the dream right there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Tom asks, what is the most beautifully designed set in sports card history? Uh, well, that, that would be a good uh, top 10, you know, video idea. But I, 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 off the top of my head, there's 1996 Pinnacle Skylines. It's a beautiful insert set. And I don't know if you know that off the, probably not, but it, it's just like a player. You sort of see their, you know, from here to here and they're in front of like the, the city, the city skyline of their city. And the sky is, the, the card is clear where the sky is. It's just a really nice looking card. I think I've heard you mention those on one of your videos. Uh, yeah, I have. Like, I have. Six yeah. eight months ago is is my gut feel for hearing you. Uh, you mentioned that set when when this question is asked, my brain goes directly to vintage. I don't yeah. even think about ninety stuff. Just my sure. my own internal bias. And for me, it's fifty three tops baseball. I, I absolutely love. And it's not necessarily the design of the card, the borders, and that kind of thing. It's it's the artwork used, like that that Willie Mays, where he's standing yeah. there, you know, with his arms, with his with his art, his hand, his glove down between his legs waiting for the ball to be hit. Like that to me is the most beautiful vintage card of all time. 53 Willie Mays. I don't know if I can think of a a prettier vintage card, Uh, but I also love the 33 Gaudis. I just love the colors and the 48 Bowmans. I mean, I love all that stuff. They're all nice. Yeah. The uh, the 53 tops is a really nice, nice artwork on there. I like the uh, I I like the fifty six tops. The design I think catches my eye with the sideways. A lot of people do because it's the horizontal version. I I I like the fifty fives better. Maybe I'm I'm just a little biased towards the Kofax and the Clemente yeah, and, yeah. and those rookies there. But I hear so many people love the fifty six tops. But I don't love it. I don't love. It, but that's <laughs> we're all so different, right? We're all yeah, yeah. we're all different. We're all different. Yeah, no. Uh, Colin Murray says the market is following the recession. I did a lot of trading at the expo or cash and trade because of the dip. Yeah. And, and Colin deals in pretty much exclusively uh, vintage. So probably a good indicator of what's going on. Okay. Rob Gardner says, I've noticed the desire for thicker game use on card auto, such as flawless. Would you break the seal and get these types of cards graded grading irrelevant for these types of cards? Same apply to one of one. So what he's getting at here is you buy a lot of these cards now and they come out of the pack yeah. in a one touch with a sticker, sure. a branded sticker. So it's really like if you open it, you've now kind of altered the state of the card. Yeah. I'll let you take it away. Um, 
I well, it depends on what your goal is. Are you looking to sell it? Or are you looking to hold on to it? If you're looking to hold on to it, you should do whatever you want. If you like it in the the seal, or if you like it in a, a if you want it graded, then you should do that. Uh, if you, I would imagine, if you're going to sell it, it's better to have it graded. But I actually wouldn't even know that based on research. I, I would guess that it's better to have it graded if you're going to sell it. I think. I think. It, I think the. Yeah. So for I personally don't like cards that come out of a pack with that seal because I want to take them out right away and yeah. make them uniform with the rest of my collection. Yeah. I hate when you got your a row of cards. I keep all my cards like my my non graded cards are in they're in top loaders and then they're in a top loader or superior fit. They're all very nicely arranged. And then if I have a card in a one touch, it kind of sticks out among all the all the one all the top loaders. And I just don't like that. So I'd love to be able to take them out, put them in a in a one touch or sorry, in a top loader. So I often will just avoid those cards altogether yeah. or I'll pick one up. I'll be like, ah, crap. It doesn't, it, it's not, it's not uniform with the rest of my collection. I'm just going to sell it and, you know, get, it's like, it's almost like a, a booklet card to me. They don't fit in my box. Oh no, yeah, I know. Booklet cards are cool, but they're so in, <laughs> tough to store. Right, right. Exactly. So when it comes to these cards that come out of the brand or out of the pack with these, with these like sealed labels, I would say either leave them in that or get it graded. At that point, I don't think it really matters. I think the hobby will accept a graded version of those cards um, as well as they will uh, they will accept the card in its original state. But yeah. for me personally, I'm cracking it out and putting it in the top loader. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and is grading irrelevant? I don't think it's irrelevant. Uh, no, and one grading one on one. I have no problem grading a one on one if you want uniformity. I mean, it's not so much about the grade, it's about the uniformity and just having it in the slab. If you enjoy that, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was, I was asked this on my last QA, and I, I think, uh, yeah, no, gra grading, whether you like grading or not, there's just so many collectors who only want graded stuff, even if it's one on ones. So, if you're not going to get a card graded, you're really you're shrinking your potential buyer pool. Um, so obviously, you know, it has to make sense given the grading fee and, and your time and stuff. But uh, grading is going to, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. 101, it, it's fine to be graded. It, it's better to be graded probably. Like well, if, you have a, if you have a 101 and it's, it's even a fairly low grade, it's still probably better in, in, the, in the holder. So dead grateful makes what, what you'd expect to be uh, a reasonable suggestion to me. Start yeah. a one-touch row in your collection. That seems That's like a true. reasonable suggestion. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's fair. But no, no thanks, Dead Grateful. <laughs> you start a one-touch row in your collection. I'm, I'm messing with you. No, that, that's a reasonable suggestion, but I don't see myself doing that. You, you never know. It, it, yeah. it really depends. If there's a set that comes out and I want to collect the whole set, then I would you know, do that, leave them in those one-touches probably, and uh, move on from there. Or I just yeah. crack them all out because they're for me anyway. So yeah, we'll see. All right, listen, Chris, we are past the two hour mark. Oh, I usually like to, wow. Yeah, fast, man. It goes so fast. <laughs> it go fast. Yeah. A great episode with you. Let's uh let's wrap this up. We've had uh great viewership. So again, I want to thank I want to thank you, Chris, for um advertising. You were coming on to Sports Cards Live with me tonight on your channel to yeah. your uh, audience. It's it's just a nice way to uh I it's just, it's just I, I thank you. I'm grateful that you do that. Brings new eyes onto my show. Hopefully sure. some of them want to subscribe and keep on uh, watching what I'm doing here on sports cards, live, live interviews every Saturday night and more. And, um, but thanks for your time, man, especially waking up to do this at 4am in the Netherlands. Yeah. I know you, I know you say you're used to it, but I still, <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful for that. So thank you yeah. so much. Oh, thanks for having me on, man. This is super fun. Yeah, you bet. You bet. We'll do it again for sure. And to the chat, to the, the regulars guys, yeah. thanks for coming out as right. always, you know, that I appreciate Everybody who does tune in or listen on the podcast, this will be on podcast too, probably within about an hour from now. And uh, again, to anyone who's new to the channel tonight, greatly appreciate you coming by, checking it out, seeing your favorite Chris on with me. I hope I did well by you in bringing out some original thoughts from Chris. If I didn't, let me know. Let me know the questions you'd like me to ask Chris, and I will do it next time we have him on. We won't wait another year, Chris. We'll give it yeah. six months or so, sure. but we'll, uh, we'll get you back on sooner then later so all right thank awesome. you uh, thank you everyone in the chat as well i, I appreciate all the, the the kind words throughout and i appreciate that tomorrow night guys on the channel on, on my collectible live show 
My guest will my guest will be Danny Black. He is also known as known as Sports Balt. He's an industry consultant. He used to work for the Braves and the Orioles, and he's uh, just a just an all around hobby guy. We'll be going live seven o'clock Eastern on this channel, and we have a full slate of shows next weekend as well. So have a great week ahead. Thank you everybody for being here tonight. Thanks to the chat for all of the engagement. Uh, thank you, Alan S. I like that. I'd give two likes if I could. Very thank. Thank you for that comment, Darren. No after hours show tonight, but appreciate you being here. Thanks for the comment. Thanks to all the comments in the chat again, everybody that we didn't get to tonight. I appreciate you. And that's it. This episode, Chris, you hang tight, but for everybody else, this episode is over. <laughs>